allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here. 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 Excellent. Yes. I'm going to scoot over here so people can come up easily. I actually have this point. I had it on. Just a second. Can you hear me now? Okay, very good. All right, so um, tonight we have a large group of commendations, and uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to talk a little bit about what I call the three A's, academics, athletics, and the arts. So we have a little bit of a smattering of everything tonight, and then we get to recognize all of our district partners. And actually, I can't even say all, because it's just um, a few of the organizations that are direct supporters of the school district in a variety of ways. So I'm glad we have a big crowd because I don't know that everybody realizes that. Um, it, it is cliche that it takes a village, but um, it's, a, it, it's an important cliche in Granville. So um, it's an exciting time of year for our seniors as they begin to hear about scholarships and make decisions on where to attend school. Uh, two high school students have advanced to the National Merit Finalist Standing. I'd like to ask Max Budd and Forrest Lee to come up at this time. at the National Merit uh, 2500 scholarship level, uh, which are awarded at the state uh, represent, or it's a state-based decision. Winners are selected without consideration of family financial circumstances, college choice, or major career plans. Uh, finalists who are also considered for corporate and college-sponsored merit scholarship choices. And I have to tell you, this is an extremely selective process. It's up less than 1% of the total population actually gets to this type of academic uh, level. So you're looking at two of the brightest people in the room. So um, <laughs> I can guarantee that up here. Uh, so I'd like to congratulate you again. It's, a, it's an amazing honor. Congratulations. students, Madison Kester. Madison, come on up. Uh, Mad <laughs> Madison, our, Madison's artwork entitled Charlie was selected to represent the District 71 and will be on display at the State House for one year representing Granville Schools. I spent 
spend way too much time at the State House, but I will be able to actually take a look at your picture uh, down there, so I appreciate that. Uh, next, I'd like the representatives from the GMS Science Olympiad team, including their coach, Mr. Grishow. So come on up. Science Olympiad team placed third in Central Ohio and qualified for the state competition. Representing the 14 member team are Nicholas Etham, Dylan Gibson, Olivia Liberty, and Eleanor Hedges DeRoy, and coach Mr. Grishow. Congratulations to all of them on this fantastic achievement. in existence for two years now? Third year. And they're already competing at the state level. That's pretty impressive. So congratulations to the team again. Um, now this next group has promised they're going to form a human pyramid over here. For me. Uh, but if I could have my competition cheer squad come up. Okay, so in, for the first time in tw the 25 year history of OASSA cheerleading state competition, the Blue Aces are Division II champions. <laughs> this team had an outstanding season, including placing fifth at the National High School Cheerleading Championship in Orlando. So our members are uh, Grace Petrick, Melissa Murphy, Ava Kunar, Rachel Shoemaker, Emma Nail, Riley Vandenberg, Georgia Bain, Peyton Wells, Emily Stockler, Brooke Fuller, Jamison Torrance, Abigail Burkholder, Maria Law, and Ellie Cubison. Congratulations. Are your coaches here too? Okay, coaches, come on up. Julie Hardesty and Bernie Stokes. Best part of my job. I know. <laughs> now, if you've never seen this team practice, go to the Commons in the winter, and I am telling you, it is the most rigorous practice I watch. They are flipping, and as a liability risk guy, it makes me super nervous. <laughs> But I trust the coaches and these girls tremendously. They do amazing work. So congratulations again, team.
Congratulations. And our last uh, group of people that we're going to recognize are what I call our district partners. Um, if you've ever received an email from me, I, I have a tagline that says, your partner in education. And people make fun of me all the time about that. They, they catch me at the IGA and they say, hey, partner, um, you know, things like that. But it's true that we are partners in the educational process, parents, students, community members are all partners. And we have fantastic uh, partners in Granville. And I'm gonna bring a few of them up today to recognize them for some of their uh, work on behalf of the schools and on behalf of the Granville community. So first I'd like to uh, have our president of the Granville PTO and any of her members that are present. <laughs> oh, you're, you're just the lone wolf. I, okay. <laughs> Terry, I, I Terry you don't have to come wolf. up if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> My other wolf is hiding. <laughs> So um, the PTO really at the elementary level, K-6, sets the tone for parent engagement in the schools. Uh, it's where we can engage new kindergarten parents, uh, especially when they're crying, leaving, you know, the kindergarten orientation because they dro just dropped off their, their baby. Um, the PTO <laughs> is there to support them and say, welcome to Granville Schools. They also provide about $80,000 every other year to support uh, art and residence, book rooms, you name it, they provide it at the elementary level and intermediate level. So a lot of the things that are add-ons to the educational experience come because of the PTO and what they do for us. And is this year or next year the uh, next auction? This upcoming year. This up upcoming year, the 17-18 school year. So uh, I know that they'll be sending out information, so I'm putting in a plug for their, their auction each year. Yes, congratulations, Jen, thank you. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Fred Wolf, uh, up, the president of the Athletic Boosters. I can tell you right now, Fred hates this. <laughs> so, Fred has been associated with the Granville uh, Athletic Boosters for almost 17 years. Um, he actually doesn't have a child in school right now. Um, we tried to flunk Maggie, but um, <laughs> she did too well and graduated anyway. But uh, she, um, Fred has done a fantastic job of uh, making sure that our 29 varsity sports have the materials that they need. Uh, they host blue and white night, they purchase equipment and uniforms. We couldn't offer the number of sports that we do without their support. So we appreciate everything that the athletic boosters do for our organization. And he's a Clevelander, you know, you gotta love him. All right, next I'd like to have Brad Betts and Don Charlton from the Music Boosters come out. So, uh, our music boosters. I like to say that we probably have the best music department in the entire state. If you've never been to a concert or a marching band performance or any type of singing performance or orchestra performance, you're missing out. It is truly world class. It's phenomenal. And a lot of the things that uh, their group, their booster organization supports um, help us educate our children in the, in the instrumental musics and the uh, string instruments. So um, they've purchased risers for us. They've purchased a box truck. Brad was just showing me the, the, the rack that they just put on it. It's awesome. It's gonna look great. 
Um, and uniforms. Uh, one of the things I love is going to our concerts and seeing our, our uh, boys and girls in tuxes and um, gowns. It's classy, it's unbelievable, but it takes a lot of work. We also have you know, a band that keeps growing and they have to buy more and more uniforms. So they do an amazing job at supporting the arts and, and specifically music within the school district. So um, Brad also does not have a child in the school anymore. Oh, but not as many as, yeah, <laughs> not as many uh, years as Fred, but we appreciate when um, past presidents and presidents stay connected to the organization to ensure a smooth transition. So thank you very much, Fred. You've, you've served your community well, so thank you. Don, you've got big shoes to fill. I do have big shoes to fill. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Next, I'd like Wendy Biddle to come up. Patel. Patel. I always do that. <laughs> she is the president of the Granville Education Foundation. So, <laughs> another unique aspect to Granville Schools is that we actually do have an education foundation that supports the teachers and the initiatives that we have in the school district. So every single year, the GEF supports teacher-initiated grants. So they spend about 10,000 per cycle in the fall and the spring to support classroom initiatives where teachers and students are engaged in that collaborative process and they say, we need additional funds to do a project. And their organization steps in and, and does that work for us. They also have started to be our alum alumni connection. They've hosted a 4th of July alumni event that was the first event of its time last year. It was a huge success, and we appreciate them reaching out to our, our recent and, and maybe not so recent graduates. Um, we, we had a guy from the class of... 20? No, 50, or 45, 1945, which was pretty amazing. So um, we appreciate all of the work that the Education Foundation done has done for us, and uh, Mr. Miller is going to report on the latest grants that they just approved at their last Thursday meeting. So congratulations, Wendy, and thank you. Okay, I would next like to invite uh, a representative from the K Club, or, uh, yeah, to represent Granville Kiwanis. And um, I'm also gonna bring up Rotary at the same time. You know, that's like, that's like really taboo, but I'm gonna do it just for the kids. The reason why they're both up here together is they model service to a community together. They might do it a little differently, but their, their initiatives are all rooted in service to others. And so the Kiwanians and the Rotarians do a fantastic job of supporting uh, community events in Granville for the benefit of the entire community. Whether it's the Rotary Bridge or it's the 4th of July um, work that the Kiwanians do, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And we don't compete with each other, we complement each other. And, and I think that's a message for all people that are interested in service to others. So the, the Kiwanis uh, group actually had their meeting tonight, so they took pictures earlier and then ran. Um, and, uh, and Rotary met this morning, so, or this afternoon, so they're fine. Um, but I'd like to thank, on behalf of the Granville Schools, both of our service organizations for modeling what it means to give back to a community. So thank you. I also will uh, commend Andy for his partnership with the GRD. Um, we have a unique partnership in Granville 
where we have youth athletics uh, that is supported by the, the GRD, but there, it's much more than athletics. It's the arts, it's um, uh, lifelong learning, adult learning, senior li um, uh, classes, everything that they do to support all the wonderful things that um, residents can enjoy in Granville. So as a member and the executive dir director of the GRD, I appreciate your partnership, so thank you. Ann Weinberg here. Oh, there you are. So, Ann Weinberg is the vice chair of the Randall Community Foundation. So, we have a community or a Granville Education Foundation, then we have a Granville Community Foundation. They are separate, uh, but they both do great work. And uh, last year, the Granville Community Foundation supported a $10,000. Uh, project-based learning initiative uh, and it provided a lot of the learning materials that we needed to support uh, teaching this instructional methodology to our staff so that your students can enjoy um, the content coming alive through real, real world applications so uh, that ten thousand dollar grant went to great use this year and this year they also approved a, um, a couple of thousand dollar grant for our GHS film club so they uh, support a lot of the initiatives that our students are engaged in. So thank you very much, Ann. Okay, next I'd like uh, Amy Dell and Eshko Curl to come on up. They are representing the uh, Licking County Foundation. So the Licking County Foundation um, supports a lot of educational initiatives, and two that I'd like to highlight. One, they have the Le Leaders for Learning grant, which is a recognition of teachers that go above and beyond. And every single year, they honor our teachers and give them a $500 stipend and a red apple, right? Yes, um, to honor the work that teachers do every day. Um, honestly, none of this is possible without great teachers. And the fact that they recognize those great teachers is amazing and we appreciate their support. The other thing that they do is they support the Tibby Leslie Travel Grant, which allows teachers to uh, travel abroad and bring that learning from their experiences back into the classroom. And uh, this year, Jane Ludwig, a third grade teacher at the elementary, received that grant and we appreciate their support um, on a regular basis. Plus, they are just fantastic for Lincoln County in general. So I know a lot of people in this room know of their work, and we appreciate their service to the community. Thank you. like seeing these guys. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm bringing them up in tandem because they really do represent our, our uh, number one priority, which is keeping students safe in our schools. And I, I can't tell you what it means to be able to pick up the phone and talk to Chief Curtis or, or Chief Caskey and say, I've got a question or I've got a concern, and they, they say, I'll be there in two minutes. Um, is Officer Dawson here? Sorry, Sergeant. Sergeant Dawson. Come on up, Susie. probably know her because she risks life and limb uh, standing sometimes at the crosswalk of uh, Granger and Spellman or Summit. Yeah. So um, we appreciate uh, Sergeant Dawson's approach to supporting the schools as well. She is hands-on, but she also understands that she's dealing with younger students or, or, or children. And so uh, we appreciate that level-headed approach and um, 
and the support of our agencies that provide our safety for us. Uh, Chief um, Curtis provided CPR training for our entire staff. Um, so every single staff member in Granville Schools is CPR certified because of the Granville uh, Fire Department. So I can't speak at highly enough about these, these two gentlemen and, and the entire course. So thank you very much. represents PACE and Kelly Bealey represents GAPS. These two organizations really, you know, our job is to educate all students. Um, students that have an accelerated track and students that are struggling in school. And um, these two groups make sure that we think about the interest of all students on a regular basis. Sometimes those are really challenging conversations for us because they challenge what we do. But when people challenge what you do, it makes you better. So we appreciate Pace and their work and GAPS uh, representing all the students of Granville. So thank you very much, Carl. So I've asked the representative to come up from the uh, GFOA award, which is, he can explain to you. So uh, it's a tre our award our treasurer is receiving in his department. Um, on behalf of all of the schools, we appreciate all of our partners. So thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Jamie Nicholson, and I serve uh, I'm the finance director for the city of Patasma. I currently serve on the Board of Trustees for the Ohio Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA. And I'm honored to be here tonight on behalf of the GFOA to present the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the Granville Exempted Village Schools. The Certificate of Achievement program has been in existence since 1946. Its purpose is to encourage and assist governments, school districts, and other public entities to prepare financial reports of the highest quality for the benefit of citizens and other partners with a vital interest in a public organization's finances. During the past 70 years that the program has existed, it has gained widespread recognition as the premier indicator of excellence in governmental accounting and financial reporting. In order to earn the Certificate of Achievement Award, the organization had to substantially conform to the program's demanding criteria, which go well beyond the minimum requirements of generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP. Oops. Sorry about that. Program participants submit copies of their Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, to the Certificate Program for an in-depth review and evaluation by two members selected from an impartial panel of government finance officers, independent certified public accountants, educators, and others with specialized expertise and experience in governmental accounting and financial reporting. Reports are also reviewed and evaluated by members of the GFOA's professional staff. Only those reports that are judged by all reviewers to have substantially met the program's criteria are awarded the Certificate of Achievement. This is not the first time that the Granville Schools has received this honor. Rather, tonight's presentation marks the seventh consecutive year that the city has received the Certificate of Achievement. The receipt of this re award reflects the professionalism and commitment of numerous individuals, as well as many hours of dedication and hard work. It is indicative of the high degree of a dedication and leadership on the part of the school district treasurer, Mike Sobel, and the district's board of education. The Government Finance Officer Association hopes that this award to the Granville Village School District will serve as an example of accomplishment and encourage others to strive for the same high standards in their own financial report. It is therefore my privilege on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association to present to the Granville Village School District with this Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Congratulations. <laughs>
more person. I knew as soon as I started to think about thanking all of the support groups that somebody would come to mind. And, and uh, Jenny Miller, come on up here. Come on up here. <laughs> she didn't know that. <laughs> Association, and she did an amazing job trying to get uh, the kids engaged in Fun Fest, uh, which was two weeks ago. And uh, she dedicated a lot of time and energy to uh, making a great day for our students. And I saw about 30 pictures of a huge cheetah in my uh, middle school, which one freaked me out from a liability perspective, but two, it was really cool. <laughs> This is the time where I say, if you are here for accommodations and you want to leave, feel free. Because otherwise you're going to be trapped here for a couple of hours. So <laughs> it's not going to hurt the board's feel, uh, feelings if you leave at this time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Joyce Mullaney, who is the superintendent of SeaTech, and uh, Ms. Priestnall, who is her um, director of academic affairs. Director of everything. everything. Yes, everything. <laughs> uh, Dr. Mullaney is going to talk a little bit about the relationship that we have with SeaTech and all of the wonderful things that occur in Granville schools and at SeaTech. So the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Corman, for uh, the invitation to address you this evening. And I'm going to try not to read directly from the slides, but I want to talk about two of the programs in partnership with Granville that SeaTech has housed at Granville and may or may not be aware. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about those. The first has a brand new name, Visual Design and Imaging. You may know that previously as Visual Communications to Arts but it is an arts-based program. And we teach a series of four courses, and those courses include... <laughs> Just in time. It's hard, it's hard to Visual creation, design, print, or digital print design, photographic composition, <clears throat> and digital image editing. We also teach two sections of Art One at Granville. So if you've had a student in Art One, they may or may not have had Jennifer Kinsley as their instructor. We're really excited with uh, kind of the real world work that Jennifer does with the students, um, including a current grand show, or great current art show that is at the Brindu right now. And Jeff was there last Thursday. It's a really nice affair. Um, we also have several students who have been recognized at the Governor's Art Show. We've done some things, some uh, community service projects such as the River Roundup Coaster Competition. And right now, our students are completing a design for the Granville Land Lab. And I've given those, um, the finalists have submitted their pictures and their designs will be voted on via Facebook from Jim Reddy, Reddy in my second. And so we're really excited to, to be able to work in those kinds of real life projects. All of our seniors enrolled in the program have been accepted to post-secondary education and will likely be taking some college credits with them that they've earned through the program. <coughs> Our newest program, in collaboration with CTEC and Granville, 
is the Information Technology Program. That's brand new this year. We serve students in grades 8 through 12. Again, it is a four course option, including web design, game design, programming, and computer and mobile applications. And one of the things we're going to show you next here, if we can get to the website, this is, this is a project that the students are currently working on in their programming class. And if you think of the old childhood game we played with paper or a chalkboard of hangman, you guess the letters and you build the scaffold as you go along. So the students have prepared the language. Let's see if you can't get to it. So on what you're seeing there on the left-hand side of the screen, again, I know it's very small, but it's the actual program language for that process. And if you can see on the right, then guess a letter builds a, a part of the scaffold. So again, this is something that the students are currently working on in their um, information technology program. Again, a little bit hard to see. The other thing, I want to show you two samples of some web design projects that the students have done. One is for Panera Bread. And again, these are designs that the students have made in Granville, uh, working with our teacher. And then Jenny's Bakery, I believe. I'm not sure Jenny's Bakery exists. Or <laughs> it, Panera, they needed to improve upon a current website that's already out there. And then this is an example of one they needed to create completely from scratch. Cool. So we're very excited about this program. Currently, both the visual design and imaging program and the information technology program have about 75 students. And we're consist consistently focusing on enrollment, increasing enrollment in those programs because <coughs> they provide tremendous opportunities. In addition to those two programs, we work, Stephanie works very closely with um, Granville administrators, guidance counselors, and teachers and we do some other kind of external support. So all of the students that are involved in a career technical program, whether it's one that we operate or one that Granville operates, are required to take some web exams. Those are administered through our district and Stephanie works closely with the teachers to get those done. Additionally, we do some um, professional development and then approve the courses through the CTE 26 process. So those are the two things that we the two programs that we currently have at Granville. Additionally, however, we do much programming, as you are aware, with our campus for high school students, mostly juniors and seniors. And we also serve, we serve many Granville students. We would also be interested in serving more. But we also do an extensive adult education programming focusing on workforce development. We are under the auspices of the Ohio Department of Higher Education, which we know is Ohio Board of Regents. And our workforce development programs essentially are able to offer the first year of a two-year degree program. Um, so for those students that maybe have changing careers or have lost their jobs and need some new training, it's a tremendous opportunity in a, um, an environment that maybe is a little less intimidating if you haven't been to school of any kind for a while. It's, a bit, it's a, often a good start. We also do a lot of customized training. Uh, so we'll have an organization, uh, Owens Corn, for example, will come to us and say we need maintenance technicians. And we will work very closely with them to create programming for new staff and or existing staff to help them meet that employment need. So I promise to be brief, but those are just a few things I wanted to share with you about our partnership with Greenville. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. I think I think I just want to make a comment that you know having CTEC staff based in Granville really has brought our organizations better closer together and I think that's really helped us a lot you know see pathways the new information technology pathway is a great example of getting some really fantastic resources from your organization in-house for us and I'm excited that our enrollment of students at CTEC is increasing as well I think that shows that you know families and our students really appreciate the kinds of education that you can do for them so I think it's fantastic our continued growth and uh, connections. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mulaney. Yes. So again, I am pleased to be here and appreciate your time. Thank you very Thank much. You.
As we transition, uh, Mr. Welker, our uh, technology director, is going to set up his um, report on our Chromebook initi initiative that's going to take place at the beginning of the 17-18 school year. So, Glenn, take it away. All right, so Chromebook initiative, um, I'll start by saying it's not labeled one-to-one. -one. One to one is a very common term when we're talking issuing uh, a single device to one student. The problem is we're only talking about 712. So I sort of hedge away from calling it a one to one initiative. It certainly is at middle school and high school, but hopefully everything we do in technology covers K-12. So I would like to start out with talking a little bit about where the district has been. This is a little bit, this goes back to basically when I started in the district, so I'll start in 2011. Over on the left-hand side, you can see our LMS, or our learning management system, was Moodle. That actually was probably in the district about two years previous to that, so it dates that back to about 2009. But previous to 2011, the, the entire district ran on one server. Um, we had unmanaged wireless, so all the little access points that you'd normally see around the building. If we had to make a change, we'd have to go to each and every one of them. To give you an example, we have about 130 of them in the district right now, so it'd be very tedious to go and make changes to each one. The other thing is it ran on a 100 megabit network. In January 2011, about the time that I started and the previous director, we basically upgraded all of the network equipment. So that included the hardwired connections in the building. They were all upgraded to one gigabit, which if you want to know all the details about how much difference it is, we can go into details, but significantly faster, 10 times faster. And then Aruba N, Aruba was just the name of the company. The wireless N protocol was the older standard by today, but about 300 megabits is what it was capable of in a perfect environment. August 2011, the phones were moved to an IP-based system. Before that, we just had a traditional, um, what we would call a POT system. Um, so all of those were moved, but it also gave us a lot more than just phones. We got video conferencing. Um, we got presence information, so now I can pick up the phone and immediately know, for example, that Jeff Brown is on the phone or in a meeting. So it gave us a lot of additional functionality outside of just the phones. I'm gonna take a huge chunk here. Between fall 2011 and the summer of 2014, we put in a lot of servers. So when I say servers and appliances, appliances are essentially a server, but they're really built for one purpose. Um, we have load balancers, we have email archivers, we have um, web filters. All of those, their only purpose in life is to do one thing and do it well. The rest of the stuff is a little bit more open-ended, but we have 17 physical servers right now in the district. We have 31 virtual servers running on that, and the two SANs are just where we're storing all of our data. That makes up about 14 terabytes of data total. In the fall of 2014, we moved to a new learning management system called My Big Campus. And then in 2015, we immediately moved to yet another one called Schoology. Um, unfortunately, when we had moved to My Big Campus, the company that makes My Big Campus, without warning, just killed off the product. So we had to scram scramble through a committee process early in the spring. We evaluated three systems and Schoology came to the top, and so far we've been very happy with that as a platform. December in 2015, dark fiber install. Sounds insidious, doesn't it? <laughs> Basically it means it's a private fiber line. So the district, as of 2015, now owns all of the fiber connecting all of the buildings. So there's a private fiber line from here back to the high school, and then from the high school it goes all the way back to the elementary, and then there's a separate line from there to the, ele from there to the district office. But we no longer lease any of those lines. In July of 2016, so just last year, we upgraded the entire wireless system again. This was a little unexpected, but I was trying to prepare the high school and the middle school for the one-to-one -one initiative, and the costs were so aggressive, we ended up updating the entire district 
for the cost of what would have been the high school. Um, AC is the newest protocol that's available to us right now. It's about 600 megabits. Um, if you talk true theoretical speeds, it's technically capable of speeds faster than our wired network, but we'd never actually see that in a real environment. And then when school started, we did start a Chromebook pilot this year, and we'll get to the Chromebooks more in, in specifics, but we had about 200 Chromebooks. They were put in a couple of mobile labs and then in a couple of small classroom sets in the high school, and those have been a fantastic success. Fall 2016, G Suite, this used to be known as Google Apps for Education. Google rebranded it. We always had an arrangement with Google, but at some point, um, well, I guess in 2016, we had to make it much more formal as far as our relationship. So we formalized the process, added a couple of servers to make sure that all of our accounts were always up to date. I should point out, we have always had a relationship with Microsoft. So Microsoft, if you go all the way back to 2011, was called Live EDU. Today it's called Office 365. That is still our primary platform for all of our students and staff. But G Suite gives us a completely separate set of tools and you'll find that some are better for certain situations. Um, summer 2017, this brings us to current, and hopefully we are gonna have a whole bunch of Chromebooks coming in this fall. I'd like to review a little bit, I know this is a little tedious, but I wanna give you an idea of where the equipment is currently in the district. At the elementary school, these, the bubbles are bigger, if we have a bigger number, Green represents Chrome devices and blue represents Windows in this case. So as you can see, like the 29 circle is our computer lab at the elementary. The three circles that are sort of apparently out in the parking lot are our mobile labs. This is just the second floor of the same thing. We go to the intermediate school, the building we're in now. We have five, um, well I guess six mobile labs. Um, a couple of classroom sets, and then the library and the computer lab are what take up the lion's share in the middle of the building. Middle and high school, so now we're getting a little bit bigger numbers. As you can see, the middle school has a lot of bubbles that are overlapping. They have a lot of classroom sets. The center of the high school, you actually get to see that that's um, a couple of classroom sets, and then also the library starts filling in a lot of that. Everything at the bottom is mobile labs. This is the second floor of the high school. So now is the, we get to the part of the slides that aren't so pretty. The visualization we have here are the age of the devices. Green's good, yellow's okay, red isn't so good. So the elementary school, anything we see in red is six or more years old. Um, the elementary is the worst um, as far as the situation they have. Part of the reason that we've got in this situation is they have very tight um, space limitations and we only had a few devices that fit in that space when we um, last purchased computers. Now we can put almost anything in and we buy micro ATX computers that we can literally bolt to the back of the monitor. So things have changed drastically, but it does need to be updated. As you can see, the bubbles at the top are actually staff laptops and the bubbles down the right hand side are mobile labs. Once again, this is the second floor. If we go to the intermediate school, it's a little bit better, but we still see quite a bit of red in the individual buildings. The middle and high school, they get even better yet. We see even more and more green, but we have a lot of antiquated equipment that needs updated. Um, the reason I'm bringing all this up is I want everyone to remember that just because we're bringing a bunch of new devices for 712, well, what happens with all the devices that are currently in the middle school and high school? There will be a shift of a lot of that equipment down to the other two buildings wherever appropriate, and then the rest will either be sold back to another reseller or will be recycled outright. Computer and device models, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of an idea of the different models that are out there for putting technology in a classroom. One-to-one, -one, which is sort of what we're talking about tonight, every child is issued a device. The devices can either stay at the school or go home with the student, but ultimately every student has their own device. If we go down on the left-hand side, mobile labs, these are sets of usually 30 devices in a movable cart. 
We usually want to, the number to be whatever would be the maximum capacity of a classroom, make sure that we're gonna cover all the students that are there. Small groups, exactly what it sounds, usually five to 10 devices in a classroom. This would be similar to the situation we currently have in the elementary. Up at the top right, BYOD or BYOT, that's bring your own device or bring your own tech. Um, I'd love to see more of this. We have tried to embrace this over the past few years. And the truth is, outside of mobile phones, the students haven't brought in a lot of devices of their own. So we do see some laptops, some tablet devices like iPads, but more than anything, what the students are bringing into the buildings are their smartphones. Classroom sets, the, same, the exact opposite of a mobile lab, it is not mobile. So we put a set of usually 28 to 30 plus computers in a room and they stay in the room. Students come in the next day and they all share access rights to those. And then the traditional labs, this might be what all of us might have been familiar with when we were in school. A traditional lab with fixed computers, usually 30 of them, usually desktops. Um, if we're thinking about what fits in for Granville, it's almost all of them. Um, it's very likely we're going to see one-to-one. -one. I'd love to see more BYOD. Um, and that truly is completely up to the parents and the students. Mobile labs, we're still gonna see very limited labs, and then the traditional labs will also be important. Why one-to-one? -one? Student motivation. Um, there's a tremendous amount of research that students get excited about having their own device. The caveat is it's a little bit like the new car smell. So, you, you're really excited about getting the device, how long will that last? The truth is the students won't have the devices that long. Most of them right now would be issued a, a brand new device when they become freshmen, and they would keep that through their high, high school career. So we're still hoping that that excitement of having the device, having it truly be their own, does continue through their education. Differentiated instruction, a lot of additional tools that are available for our intervention specialists, or our gen ed teachers to um, tackle different groups and sizes. Communication, all everything across the board from email to group chats, it gives them a lot more capabilities communicating with their peers. Um, a funny story is when my daughter first started using Google Docs, you know, we as a district said, well, the kids can't have chat. Well, the very first thing her friends and her did were they just typed inside of a Google Doc, and because it had collaborative editing, they were using it like a group chat client. But not really intended, but kids will find a way. Um, Student-directed learning or student ownership of learning, certainly when the students are taking the devices home at night, we hope that that excitement for learning is going to continue outside of our four walls. If the students want to take on a project that's not a part of their curriculum, now they have an additional tool to tackle that. Um, collaboration, just as I spoke a few minutes ago, um, Office 365 and Google both have a lot of different tools for collaborating on documents live, and certainly the ability to digitally share things, even inside of Schoology or LMS, provides a lot of opportunities. And global connections, by this I'm pretty much referring to the internet. The, the students have full access to the entire world, and it's something that is absolutely unprecedented. A lot of these things might look familiar if we look at this in a little bit different light. Oh, this is a slide I've seen a lot from Mr. Brown and Brian <laughs> Burnett. What I, what I want to point out is this one-to-one -one shouldn't be something unique to technology. Technology is never going to work on its own. But when put in the framework of what we're already trying to do, specifically in this diagram, where we see student learning, at the very bottom, I'm not sure why it's so small in this diagram, but project-based learning, which is a huge initiative for the district over the next coming years, it fits in perfectly with what we're trying to accomplish. We can't talk for a second about the device. I know I've been seeing Chromebooks. I do intend on buying Chromebooks for the one-to-one -one device. Um, I truly think it's the best device. It's cheap, and they're extremely quick. I don't want to say cheap as in a plasticky throwaway type of model, but it's very, very affordable for the value that we get out of it. Is it a perfect solution for everything? Absolutely not. Um, a perfect example of where the Chromebooks fall short is 
video editing. Anytime you're trying to move that amount of data in a cloud-based device, it's never going to work well. So we're going to have to fall back to one of those other computer models, like a traditional lab or a mobile lab, that has a little bit more horsepower to accomplish some of those. And as a part of this, we are putting a brand new mobile lab in each of the middle school and the high school to make sure that we are covering those bases. And some of the physical um, traditional labs will also be left as well. The actual manufacturer is going to be a Lenovo, and the device is called an N23, if anybody's curious about it. It's an 11 inch device, it's very portable. They're a little unique in that the little camera at the top rotates, so it has one of the only outward facing cameras. Most Chromebooks are set up to where the, the camera only faces in, so you can do video chat type of um, activities. This one you could go outward, which would allow the students to take photos of their projects. So some of the keys to success. Professional development, I probably can't say that top one enough, and if you read the actual little tiny type, staff, students, and parents. I do not want to leave parents out of this mix. The staff and students, the students I think we think are going to get it. They are, but I don't think they're just going to naturally jump onto the Chromebook and use it really effectively. They just fall into some of the tools easier than us. But the staff and the parents are probably going to need a little bit of help as far as what do I use this for, how do I integrate it into my classroom, and that's going to be a really important piece of this puzzle. <coughs> Technological support, unfortunately the kids and the staff members are going to break their devices. Um, there's nothing we can do to prevent accidents, and I want to make sure that we have easy access to get the device repaired, give them a loaner when it is being worked on or repaired, so that they can get back to what we're really trying to accomplish. They're also going to be asking for those resources where they have questions and they don't quite know how to answer it, and hopefully we can provide them that within our individual help center. Um, sustainability, this is just long-term planning to make sure that this isn't a one-time purchase for the district and then we forget all about it. We will have to have a continuous purchase for the incoming seventh graders or freshmen or possibly even farther back if this goes successfully to make sure that we can continue the program. And if you look at the bottom, what future innovations might disrupt our plan? It's really hard for us to say that, well, we got a Chromebook and we're set for five years. That's just not the way it works in technology, especially in K-12. I really hope that we can adapt to whatever changes happen in the marketplace to always give us the best tool for the job. But teachers, students, and parents will have to understand we may have to change devices three years into this depending on what's best at that time. We are ready. Teachers have been begging for this. This conversation about one-to-one -one has been happening in this district, I would safely say about 10 years. I've been in the district going on seven years and it has been almost a, a weekly conversation in one way or another of how can we do this. The teachers um, already know how to teach. We are blessed with incredibly talented teachers. This is just giving them one more tool in their toolbox. Learning management system. I think this is a huge piece of the puzzle. Right now, like I said, we have Schoology, but not only does it provide us a safe environment for social media access, it provides us an online platform for assessments, it, a paper-free um, tool for handing in or distributing work. Um, it has a lot of group chat capabilities. It, it really is a very deep package depending on how we want to use it. The bottom left, the infrastructure, our network has been repeatedly upgraded in preparation for this. This hasn't been a random, well, let's just upgrade the, the, the wireless to AC. We made significant investments in making sure that whatever devices we put in here, we'd be able to support. And when we add in 1,300 devices this coming year, it's going to put a strain on our network. And I know for sure that we are ready to handle that network traffic. And down the services and tools, these are tools that we might have used in the past, and then also things like G Suite that we've added recently to manage and support, and more importantly, protect our users. 
devices will be filtered. Um, all of our devices inside of our building have always been filtered, but it's actually part of our obligation as a district to protect the devices in or outside of the district. This is the part that, that's incredibly exciting. Everybody wants to talk about policies, right? There are four policies that we have that refer basically to our network in some way or another. EDE-B defines our BYOD policy. <clears throat> At this time, I haven't recommended any changes to that policy. EDE in the bottom left refers to internet safety. This gets into our CIPA compliance and what our obligations are as, an, as a K-12 organization to not only protect the kids from things like internet filtering, but we also have an education obligation to them. We can't just provide the web filter without telling kids what possible dangers are out on the internet. EDE-R defines acceptable use of our district's network and devices. This has a very small clause that is referring to this last clause, um, and really it's just, the only reason it's being modified is to just refer to the right policy. The last one, GFCK, covers the use of personal devices. This policy in the past was worded in such a way that students could bring your own personal device, whether it's an iPad, they were really referring to phones, although it, it specifically states things like Blackberries and that type of thing that haven't been around for quite a while. But it explicitly said that they could never be turned on. A lot has changed in six years when this policy was adopted. What I did was I flipped the policy to where you can absolutely keep your device, keep it on, unless directed by a staff member that you shouldn't. So it's just trying to make it more permissive language rather than making it, please don't ever use these in the building. The reality is, once again, our students are bringing in mobile phones that are still a viable tool to be used in the classroom but we have to allow them to use it. We can't be punitive every single time that they pull out their phone and expect they're gonna be you know, texting their, their buddies underneath the table. Um, Chromebook policies, I can't remember exactly, but I think I've given the board about seven different individual documents. There's a Chrome handbook, there's a discussion of fees, FAQs, that type of thing. But these are the four that I'd like to highlight. There is gonna be a technology fee associated with this. So if you have a student in seven through 12, the yearly fee will be $40. There's also a cap of $100. So if you have three children, um, you will have a maximum of $100. Um, that fee goes into a lot of different things, services, but the biggest thing that we're using the fund for is to self-protect our devices with sort of a self-warranty program for us. And, um, hopefully that fund will be big enough that we can cover all the devices. The, um, if we go over to the right hand side, the repair as part of that, if your child accidentally drops their device or somebody runs into them in the hall and it goes flying out of their hands or they shut a pencil inside the case, whatever may happen, we're gonna replace or fix the device once a year. So that $40 will get you one free repair. After that, it will be the obligation of the family to pay for whatever the damage is. We're not going to mark it up and we're not going to charge labor costs of any kind. It's going to be flat what did the repair piece cost, whatever the item was. <coughs> Protection, um, protecting the device is the responsibility of the student. Um, we went through a lot of different committee processes. One of the, one of the uh, committees that we talked to was in the class ed committee and um, there was a little bit of conversation about what we should do as far as the fees and bags. Um, in the end, I tried to pick a happy medium. I lowered what I thought should be the fee and we are not providing bags. I highly recommend that the parents or the students buy bags on their own, but now you get the flexibility to buy whatever bag you want and not have one that looks like every other student in the district and hopefully you get a little tiny bit of the money back that we didn't charge you in a, in a fee. <coughs> and then the last thing is education. The, the Chromebook, I hope that all the students have fun with it and they use it for any kind of reasonable um, use. 
but it is being provided for educational purposes. It is going to be a tool that we expect to be working and available every day in the school. So if they can't get to a gaming site or something of that nature, it's because we thought it was dangerous or harmful in some way. And that's it. And I am available for questions. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Are, are we, is there a complementary kind of policy going in place? Because we know Wi-Fi can be a tricky beast in the township. So if one night it goes out and kids have to do a report, is there? I don't know who to ask that to. Yeah. I'm sorry, I wasn't here. Oh, to just if there's, if there's uh, like high winds and the Wi Fi is knocked out, but kids have to do homework that night. Yeah, definitely. Is there going to be some things school wide that says, okay, you're exempt that day? Or? We're definitely, teachers, staff members, we're all going to have to be understanding that that type of thing is going to happen. We also know that all of our kids do not have wonderful internet access at home. I think a lot of us have got used to the fact that, oh, well, broadband internet, of course I have it at home. That's just not reality for some of our kids. So the district so far, at least at this point, won't be able to afford some kind of access point that you would take home. We will provide some kind of list of access points or free Wi-Fi around our city. But yes, if even if you have it in Granville for whatever reason, you know, Windstream loses all of their internet access for a night. It won't be one student, it'll be 200, and we will definitely know by it, and the exceptions would definitely be there. You mentioned kind of professional development as being critical. Is there something planned specifically for our professional development days in the curriculum and how we introduce Chromebooks specifically and their capabilities to our staff? Definitely. So the most explicit training we have is for the, the staff members during the summer. We have, um, two separate sections and we actually have a couple of different dates for the teachers to come in they can actually get graduate credit as well for that um, evan mccullough jill mary and um, beth downing and myself will be providing that primarily the the three of them providing the training um, outside of that we um, also have training coming up for the students so we'll try to hit the students when they come into the buildings at the beginning of the year we usually have limited contact with them when they first come in. At the middle school, it looks a little bit more like they're trying to set up PIB accounts and they've never reset their password on the network. So it's a little bit like you're moving into the, the big leagues and there's some um, housekeeping that needs to be done. At the high school, it's more of uh, network safety. What are we gonna do? Did I forget my password from last year? But we do have a couple of windows that we can tackle for that type of thing. We're also gonna give them essentially a take home homework assignment. So when we do hand out the devices, it'll probably be a week or two, it looks like at this point, before school starts and they'll be given some offline tasks. The only thing I'm not um, complete, that I haven't completely clarified is what I wanna do for the parents. It'll probably be more of a parent night. So we will have a couple of parent nights where myself and my staff are available and we will probably have a couple of agendas to talk to you about how does the Chromebook work, how does G Suite work, what is Office 365, but then also it'd be an open forum so we can possibly answer questions that aren't as easy to get answered during the week when you're trying to get a hold of our staff. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, if you'd like to make any comments about anything, we'll do it during public comment. Um, we usually don't do a um, you know, back and forth. That's These are staff reports mostly for board information, but we, we we're happy to have your um, comments and feedback and concerns at um, that time. Mm -hmm. Anything else from the board? No. Thank you, Klein. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Okay, as we transition to Mr. Sobel's five-year uh, forecast, I'll just prep everybody by saying that uh, the five-year forecast is required uh, twice a year, uh, once in October and then in May. The school district is obligated to um, provide a five-year forecast to the state of Ohio, even though the budget cycle that the state General Assembly provides is a two-year uh, budget we get to forecast for five years. So, a little <laughs> subtle uh, tongue in cheek there. Um, Mr. Sobel. Thank you. I'm very excited. This is probably the 11th or 12th of these that I have done. And I have to say, 
there are more people here than all the previous ones combined. They're all compelled against their will. <laughs> you know, when you get me an audience, you guys are in trouble. Um, if I like your forecast for May, um, compared to the October forecast, the May one's on the bottom, the October one's on the top, you'll see it is really not materially different um, in where we are right now versus where we thought we would be in October. Um, if you look at fiscal 2020, which is circled, you see a difference of about $170,000, which is essentially in a five-year forecast on a $28 million budget, $30 million budget is kind of rounding here, it's about $40,000 a year. So there's really not much difference from where we were looking in October. Um, looking at the revenue side of the budget, the only thing really different this year um, from where we were in October, we are getting a little bit higher property tax collections than we had anticipated in October. A couple reasons for that. One, had a little bit more new construction than we were expecting from on the books last year. Uh, we had a couple properties that were badly delinquent um, down by Wendy's across the street there that sold in the last six months had very significant delinquency payments um, that were made on those. And then we're because now the current owners are now saying current on their taxes, our current collection rates are a little bit higher as well. And so that's really driving the revenue. The, nothing else on the revenue side is really markedly different from what we were anticipating back in October. On the spending side, um, you'll see our personnel costs and our insurance benefits are both a little higher than they were in October. On the personnel costs, there was some under, underestimating in a couple areas. The health insurance, we have open enrollment in October. Um, starting January 1st, we had about 40 staff members who had not been taking our insurance, start taking it, and that added on to the cost. Offsetting that are considerably lower supply and material costs than we were anticipating in October. The original forecast, we built in a lot of money because of potential rises in diesel prices. Diesel prices have remained low, so we are not spending nearly as much as we expected to uh, for diesel. And also our testing costs, um, have, because of some of the changes being made at the state, are going to be a little bit lower than we were anticipating. That's kind of the overview. Um, if you look at our enrollment forecast for the next five years, enrollment overall stays fairly stable, growing very slowly over the period. Really, the big item you see in the circle there, and that is kindergarten next year. Um, we are currently forecasting having a class of 170 kindergarten kids. We have not had a class that size since about 2004. Uh, we are already, yeah, you know, this year at 139 right now, we are already well past that with our registration for next year. We do expect to get somewhere very close to that 170 number by the time we get all of the um, summer move-ins and new registrants going. Because of demand, we actually are adding a fourth all-day kindergarten um, for tuition class next year. We started that, I think, two, three years ago. We started with two classes. This year, we had enough demand for three classes. We now have enough demand for four classes, which we can still do within our space and resources um, within the budget. Potential enrollment risks, and most of the enrollment risks are on the upside. Um, these things are not factored in right now. Um, what we do know about um, coming into the, the district, there's a, you know, we just heard a couple weeks ago about a 30 to 35 home development on Silver Street um, that's supposed to be built out over about four years. Um, there's 20 to 25 homes down on 37. Um, I think the first phase, they're just doing some building and getting done. The colony, there's a new development across the street from the colony, a newer Granville Road. It's supposed to be colony-like. Um, I think two-bedroom condominium-type units um, geared towards seniors and, and older folks, but we'll probably you know, get some kids from that. We have phase two of Redwood Apartments on River Road. That's supposed to add about 35 more units. Um, those are, I believe, about complete now. And those, while they're all two bedrooms, um, we are generating about one student for every three units there. So we're a little bit more than we had been anticipating. There's a couple of small developments going in, one on the 
Croaking property up near Wildwood Park, and another up on North Street around King Township, each with about a dozen homes. So there's probably 100 to 125 new units um, that we'll be seeing over the next probably four years. Um, the, and that may push, you know, push our enrollment a little bit above what is in the forecast right now. The other, there are three other properties that we are keeping an eye on that have sold in the last year um, that are large tracks. There's a, a 58 acre track and two tracks are over 70 acres that have turned over in the, within the last year. Usually when you see something like that, it's not because somebody is buying them to continue farming them. Um, there's a good chance someone is planning to do something with them. We have no concrete plans right now, but we're keeping an eye on those um, and the potential for development with those. Looking at overall revenue um, overview for the upcoming, by, or upcoming five year period, if you look over the last five years, our revenues grew at about a rate of 3.6% annually. The biggest piece of that um, was our property tax growth driven by the new levy in 2013. You know, that, without that, the growth rate would have been a lot slower. We're projecting a growth rate about half of that going forward, about 1.8% per year. Um, while we are anticipating a new levy, I'll talk about that in a little bit next year. This does not have any revenue from a new levy in it. First of all, the state does not allow us to put it in anyway until it is passed. But this is, so this is a forecast without any new additional money. State aid, um, you know, we're not quite sure what's going to happen there. We have a governor's proposal right now. Um, the House version of the budget um, is actually going to be accepted tomorrow. Um, we will probably <coughs> around lunchtime tomorrow have some idea um, what is in there. I've heard some inklings of what is in there that I'm not real comfortable discussing publicly until um, we have a little bit better sense. Um, the big risk here, you look at the two areas that are circled in red. Um, for us, the biggest risk is in our transportation funding. We get about $600,000 a year in transportation funding. The governor's proposal would cut that by 25% next year, and then an additional 8% the year after that. So essentially, by 2019, we'll have lost, under the governor's proposal, we'll lose about a third of our funding for transportation. <coughs> you, know, you see, we're getting $600,000 a year, so that's $200,000 of potential loss. And that's really our biggest risk in the forecast. We'll know a better sense tomorrow whether that has survived in the house or not. You know, the other area, you know, we have traditionally gotten about a hundred dollar per student increase in aid each year. Um, the governor's proposal it is staying flat, six thousand dollars for the upcoming biennium. I have heard there's going to be more money than that in the formula. What we don't know is how it's going to manifest itself in there. Um, so, but that's not our biggest, you know, because our state share percentage is only about 33%, you know, that $100 per student, we only get 33 of that anyway. So that's why the transportation is really um, a bigger piece of that than the per pupil funding. Right now, last year we were guarantee funded, meaning if you use the formula, it said we should have gotten $192,000 less than we got. This year we've been on the guarantee, but I think by the time the fiscal year is over, we actually will just come off the guarantee and get a little bit more funding this year um, than we got last year. The other piece of our revenue side is our um, real estate taxes. This is a reappraisal year for Licking County. Um, you'll see and circled on the right residential property values, the five-year forecast has an estimate that values within the district will go up 10%. Um, it is actually probably going to be a little bit higher than that, a couple percentage points higher than that across the um, district. It's a fairly large, um, large growth. Mike Smith, the county auditor, is here with us tonight, so if any of you have questions about what might happen with the reappraisal, he said he would be happy to talk to you afterwards if you have questions. 
he volunteered to come. I didn't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but so we there will be the t the ten per, a ten to twelve percent increase in values. The ironic thing of all this, it sounds like as values go up, we should get more money. When our reappraisal, when the values go up, we actually get less net money in the five-year forecast when those values get up because we actually lose more money in state aid because we're getting wealthier as a district than we're gaining in additional property tax revenue from the higher valuation. So if that 12 to 10 does become 12, that actually hurts the forecast marginally. It's not, not a huge impact, but it does hurt the, the forecast marginally. Um, the other big thing you see, you see agricultural values. Well, that's not a big portion of our school district. Our projected to go down 7% this year at reappraisal. Land that is in current agricultural use value, which is a special way of uh, ag land is valued is actually statewide going down 26 percent um, on average because a lot of our ag value is not in that type of land that 26 percent if that's what it goes down in the district only had, ends up being a seven percent drop overall in our ag value roughly um, and so those are the forecasts that we have there for our, our residential and agricultural values and really that covers that's pretty much where we get all our money from as a, for as a budget. We either get it in real estate revenue or we get it in our state aid. Those two combined are about 95% of our revenue. Looking at the expenditure overview, um, last year, the last five years, we grew at an average annual rate of about 2.3%, uh, probably fairly in line with inflation. Um, the big driver of that was our wage out, wages only went up 1.3%. Primarily, that was because of the 2013 RIF, um, where we did eliminate 19 positions from the school district. That, of course, depressed our overall salaries um, and affected the whole five-year forecast period. Um, you'll see going forward, we expect to grow about two percentage points faster. A little bit of that is, is misleading. If you look in 2017, you see a nearly 3,000% increase in um, our spending for transfers. That's actually the money to implement what Mr. Walker was talking about. Uh, that is the payments for the one-to-one. -one. And also, because of the infrastructure issues we had in our redoing the tennis courts um, and dealing with spring water that was under the tennis courts, that ended up costing us a little more than we thought was going to have to go anyway. Um, the you see overall um, our salaries grow um, at about about 4% a year. And probably the best thing to get in there is to go into the labor agreement. Um, just last week, the board and the GEA uh, both approved the new labor agreement for the upcoming three years. The, the three-year agreement has base salary increases of two, two, and two and a quarter for each of the three years. And thanks to the work, really, of the district and the willingness of the GEA and the insurance committee to work with us, we are doing a major overhaul of how we provide insurance um, to all of our employees. Insurance has been the fastest growing area um, in our budget at an unsustainable rate. And so we are moving from a PPO, the traditional type of insurance, to a two-tiered high deductible health care plan with healthcare savings accounts. We will, we will fund a significant amount, amount of the money initially in the healthcare savings accounts. That will continue going forward depending on how well we control our overall spending. Um, we will continue making those payments. But um, you know, another big factor here, again, is a little bit more cost sharing of premium increases beyond the first year, um, hopefully with the idea that with the new health care plan, we will hold down the expenditure growth rates that we have been seeing, and then really all of us will benefit um, from the changes that we made. So again, I would like, I know the board would like to thank the, you know, both the association and the, you know, the administration for working hard to help us really maintain a more fiscally tenable um, outcome as far as the, the um, contract going forward. So that's the summary of the May, of the May forecast. Um, 
As I said, the financial outlook has not changed substantially since October. Uh, we are anticipating a new levy during the five-year forecast period. Uh, the cash balances you saw in the, the early graph are expected to approach zero um, in the 2019-20 school year. Do you remember those graphics showing three to five hundred thousand dollars of cash? That's approach. That sounds like a lot of money. That's approaching zero when you consider one payroll for us is about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So three to five hundred thousand dollars of cash is not even enough to make one payroll. Um, so that. That is what we mean by approaching zero. The other piece that we are having to deal with with the levy, um, we have our PI, our Permanent Improvement Fund, which funds the maintenance of our buildings and also purchases of buses and technology and such. Um, the biggest piece of that is a 1.7 mil levy that expires in 2019. We also have a half mil maintenance levy that was tied back to the construction projects back in the early 90s. That expires in 2019 by law, it cannot be renewed. And then we also are expected to be able to reduce our bond millage rate in 2019 by about six tenths of a mill because of the refunding of our bonds that we did last year, which are saving the district about three and a half million dollars in interest payments over about a 15 year period that really starts in 2018, 2019. And then we have what's called the New York Granville Community Authority. It's a special assessment on the area around park trails. That actually goes to the school district, must be used for capital. Those are 20 year assessments from the time that the homes were first <coughs> occupied. Well, those homes were first occupied there in 2001. And so we're coming up into, we're now in the last four or five years of getting that money. That money will start phasing out in 2021. And by 2025, about 85% of that revenue uh, will no longer be coming to the district because those will be phasing out. So we have significant issues in our capital budget in maintaining our buildings. Adding on to that is we have to replace the roof in this building this year. Um, because of lost shingles, because of wind, that is a substantial amount of money um, that we are doing that. So what we're gonna try and do with the levy strategy is to solve both our operating needs and our um, capital needs with one um, issue. And so what we are strongly considering based on economic factors and needs is looking at an earned income tax issue to put on the ballot probably sometime during 2018. An earned income tax would tax only, well, earned income. Um, it would not tax primarily senior citizens who are living on fixed incomes would not, they would not pay that unless they're still working. It is not an investment income and things like that. Um, what it would do from work, some, some of the information that we've been able to put together and some of the demographics that we've been able to put together of our base, first of all, we do know that about 26% of the owner-occupied homes within the school district are owned by someone who's 65 years of age or older. So one out of every four homes is owned by, a senior, by someone who's a senior citizen. We also know that an income tax will, more, will fall a little bit more heavily on the families who are sending the kids into the school district. So it does a little bit more to align um, the payments with the people who are using the system. And then what we will do is if we are able to do, take this approach, we would take some of our inside millage and move it to permanent improvement to give us a stable and a little bit bigger funding source, and then allow the PI levy to expire and not renew it after 2019. We would not have the, the yeah, we would not be renewing the maintenance levy because we can't. We would have the bond levy millage going away. And so what really ends up happening, we would get about a two and a half mil drop in property taxes, which is about 5% property taxes 
that are pay, paid to the schools right now. And so basically what we're trying to do is shift a little bit of our base away from property tax to the income tax, again, which falls more on the people who are using the services, give some relief to senior citizens. And, and, and part of what, going back to the reappraisal and the 10 to 12% increase, part of what's happening is um, there's been a kind of historic undervaluing within Licking County um, that Mr. Smith is really trying to correct where the home hasn't turned over as much. The values have not really kept up with market. And that's what, so part of what's driving that 10 to 12% increase is trying to get homes back up to more market values. And a lot of that's gonna be falling on people who've been in their homes for longer periods of time, a big chunk of which is probably our senior population. And so they may be looking at some larger increases in property taxes than the whole. And so this approach then gives them a little bit of relief as well from you know, the catching up in the valuations and also then to have a new levy that for the most part that they are not going to have to pay. And so that, that's really a, a big factor um, in the strategy that we are looking at um, for next year. And with that, I will stop. Questions? Because we have such a large crowd here, I'll, I'll compliment um, <laughs> our treasurer. Uh, Mr. Sobel comes, came to us with 25 years in the Department of Taxation. Um, there is nobody that is more knowledgeable in the state of Ohio than Mr. Sobel when it comes to taxation. Uh, he gets called every single day, sometimes by the General Assembly, sometimes by, you know, uh, ODE to answer questions about um, numbers that are occurring across the state. And I know the relationship between uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Sobel is strong, and they partner a lot on making sure that the values are appropriate for our community. And he's a true community asset, and um, it's not just because I have to work with him. <laughs> so, yeah. I came a little bit to say that. Yeah. But uh, I think this is evidence of solid financial planning on, on the part of the district, and so I appreciate it. Well said. Thank you. Given that the state budget hasn't come out yet, it could affect our forecast. Would we have to re like when when do we have to file the forecast by and would we make any changes based on the, the my plan is actually to try and file the forecast tomorrow. Um, the board will adopt morning. it tonight. My plan is to adopt yeah, in the morning. That's <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> If they're not set it tomorrow, realistically, the problem is that, you know, the House may be different than what was in the governor's proposal, but it's still got to go through the Senate and the conference committee. We're not really going to know until the end of June what's in the five-year forecast uh, or in the state budget, what that might do to the five-year forecast or what it might not do to the five-year <coughs> forecast. And so I don't think... You know, that by, I know we're doing it a month earlier than normal. Normally we've done it in May. We're doing it a little bit earlier <coughs> this time. Um, I don't think that, you know, we aren't going to know for sure anything more at our May 22nd meeting than we know today. Or, I mean, we know a little more tomorrow, but that's still not going to matter. We can make a decision, you know, if we get to the end of June and something has happened that causes a market difference in the forecast. We could, we don't have to wait till October to do another one. We can do an update if, if we think that it's material enough um, to be worth it. It's something, again, we'll evaluate that once we see the, the final results of the budget. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from the board? No, that's great work. Hey, Mr. Welker, will you switch the presentation? Excellent. I know you all came for the five-year forecast conversation and stayed, so um, I'm joking. I think most of you are here because we're going to be discussing the draft substance use prevention policy. Um, but before I get into the details of my presentation, I really want to uh, talk a little bit about the process and the history. Um, 
uh, and context of this conversation because I think it's relevant for everybody in this room who haven't spent many years watching board meetings um, to get the context and the history behind the conversation. Um, this has honestly been a two-year conversation at the board level. Uh, it started as a byproduct of looking at pride survey results that have been, I would say, relatively, relatively stable and our whole child committee that is a superintendent's committee looks at that data annually and um, there were indicators that you know 51 percent of our seniors were reporting uh, alcohol use within the last 30 days marijuana use at 25 percent and prescription drugs at nine percent and um, the board started down a conversation around how can we potentially start to uh, prevent some of those numbers from increasing in the future and um, do something that will help address the help the students address that issue that they're uh, engaging in or having to face in our schools um, fast forward a year into that conversation the board in, in June of 2016 decided to make a change to the athletic policy that moved the threshold for a, uh, a violation of the alcohol, tobacco, and drug policy from 10% uh, of a loss of a, an academic or an athletic contest to 30% uh, for the first offense and 50% for the second offense. Um, this really was part of a, converse, a broader conversation of we're not ready yet to have the conversation about a potential uh, random student drug testing program and we need to do more research and have more conversation about that. Um, the challenge with our current policy as it stands for athletics only is the threshold of actually uh, having a violation means that you, our staff has to have direct observation or a police report on a student violation, which is an extremely high threshold um, to meet in order to enact the policy. And so what you have had in the past is, um, uh, I would say, rumors in window of student use that, that uh, is widely known to maybe people in the community, but we haven't had evidence to suggest that we could enact our policy. Um, we've had substance abuse forums, substance <laughs> use uh, prevention forums. We've had two work sessions. And the lat latest work session, a couple of um, well, actually last year, the board really just said we want to take a comprehensive approach to this issue. And because we're an educational orient organization, we should take an educational approach. And so we, we talked about what does the education look like in the schools related to substance use. We wanted to look at our current data collection. Uh, we were using the PRIDE survey, which was really uh, the spring semester of our 12th graders uh, reporting their uh, substance use or abuse. And what we wanted to do is get more of a, uh, a wide range picture of use from uh, 7th grade through 12th grade. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. They also wanted to start looking at the cultural implications and empowering our students to make healthy choices and to look at some of the ways that, uh, or, or some of the, I would say, the precursors to uh, substance use, which could be high stress levels and uh, the lack of coping strategies on behalf of the students. And then the final part, which is probably why all of you are sitting in this room, is the potential for a drug testing program. Um, I want to say right up front um, that this is the first reading. Uh, no decision is going to make, be made. When the board makes a policy decision, it looks at it um, over two meetings to make sure that the public has the opportunity to speak to them. So actually, it's really positive that you're here. And because we sit through a lot of meetings where there isn't a lot of community input. And they are your, your representatives for the school. And they are volunteers, and they are your neighbors, and they are your friends. So um, I wanted to uh, say that up front as well. So that's kind of the history and context. So this is not a new conversation. Um, so what we did this year, and I have to credit uh, Mr. Bernath back there, we looked at education. 
What we found was very similar to every other school district that we contacted about their education programs, which is it was happening but hit and miss and not as consistent as what we would like to see in the K-12 experience for stu students. So we identified a program uh, by the Mendez Foundation called Too, Dr Too Good for Drugs. Although it says too good for drugs, it is really more of a prevention and life skills oriented program, uh, which really tries to arm students through social role play and scenario based uh, conversations that you know, they have choices that they can make that are uh, protective to them and are healthy behaviors as opposed to unhealthy behaviors. There is also a significant parent involvement component. One of the things that this board has recognized is, um, and wrestled with, is the Board of Education doesn't necessarily want to be in the business of, um, business alone of dealing with substance use. It's a partnership. And parents need to be engaged in that process because, you know, we together jointly help educate students on a variety of different topics. This is no different. And so what we found was we didn't really have a lot of parent um, involvement 7 through 12. And this program does support that. So next year, the board has already uh, given the green light on this program to be implemented K through 12. So now we'll have consistency in the implementation of the education component around um, substance use. Uh, the data collection. So part of the issue that the board had in looking at the data that we did have was that it was a, a very myopic look at a student population. And we wanted to take a broader uh, analysis and look at the, the um, risky behaviors that students engage in. And so the state of Ohio actually created the OES survey and it is 111 questions that get into a wide range of topics, one of which is substance use. And it is given in grades seven through 12. We actually implemented that assessment or that survey in the fall. We are still trying to extract that information from the state of Ohio. Um, so I was on the phone with the program director today and saying, please help me out. I need some information for the board going into their May conversations. Uh, but the goal is to create a baseline. Um, what, what we have always done as a Board of Education and Governance team and administrative team is to use baseline data and then create performance indicators to show that we're actually moving the needle on whatever it is, whether it's academics, arts, athletics, you name it, um, we create these performance indicators. And so we want to create the baseline data, create some performance indicators to see how successful the education program is. Um, and how we're moving the needle related to some of these uh, risky behaviors. So, um, and a byproduct of that would be a state of the student's <coughs> annual report. We always do a state of the schools, which really captures the essence of academic performance, um, but we really do care about the whole child. Um, we know that we want to send students out into the real world, not just being very good, or, or being book smart. We want them well-rounded and understanding um, much more than just the academic uh, content that they learn in the schools. So the state of the students looks at the whole child, um, social, emotional, and physical wealth or health of the school district and the students. And that would include exit surveys. We currently give exit surveys in third, sixth, eighth, and twelfth grade. And it talks about students. Do you have a, a staff member that you resonate with or that you feel cares about you. We want to know that information. Every child should have a go-to person in our schools. And I, I'm proud to say that we, we have done a lot of work in that area so that we do have that support network for students. Um, there, it's, it's not easy being a student these days. It was a lot easier when a lot of us, and I can include myself in that, were going through school. It's a little different now and we need to have that support network for students. So um, it will include those exit survey results. Uh, it will include the OES results when we get them. And one of the things that we suffered from was the ability to communicate when, when um, 
behaviors do occur, there are consequences. Um, so we're gonna look at communicating aggregate student code of conduct results, and why. We are, students are protected under federal legislation called PERPA, and it's their education privacy rights. And so when a student misbehaves, we do not take them down to Broadway and advertise that they have been disciplined for their poor choices, okay? Um, because that is inappropriate um, and uh, it's against federal law. But what happens is the perception can be that we don't actually address issues. And that's, that's not true. And so what we're trying to do is under, help people understand that Sometimes they don't know that students are actually being um, worked with by parents, mental health professionals, the schools. It's a team effort. Um, so we're going to try and report some of that out. But we will never, ever communicate what has happened to an individual child related to any of these issues. Uh, cultural implications. Last week, uh, Dr. Corman and I sat in a uh, student leadership work group that talked about uh, the stressors that students in feel uh, in, in our schools. And the cultural implication was the board's desire to um, be more preventative and proactive and not just reactive in consequences. I can guarantee you that this board is not interested in throwing the book at anyone. Our job is to educate students. And that's our primary responsibility. But we do have a code of conduct, and we will enforce it when it's necessary. But I think the approach has been proactive and positive coping strategies for stress and risky behaviors. Working with students, we, we have amazing kids in our schools. They're brilliant. They're passionate. Um, many of them are sitting in this room right now. And we want to empower them to help uh, impact their fellow, fellow peers in making healthy choices. And so we really want to use that cultural approach in this process. And then collaboration with community partners to address stress and mental health. We have a lot of resources in Lincoln County um, that we can tap into for whatever issues students might be experiencing. And we do on a regular basis, but I think it's important to collaborate on a regular basis with our guidance counselors, our administrators, with these support uh, organizations. And so that those would be falling into the cultural implications. So all that really gets us to then the final piece of their discussion, which is starting tonight and will end on May 22nd. But really looking at two policies that are targeting um, an asset or, or uh, testing program, a random drug testing program within the schools. So just for, for your information, this is the first reading tonight. No decisions are being made. The second reading and a vote would, would occur if the board chooses to place it on the agenda um, on May 22nd. Two policies came out of the work session that, would, that occurred a couple of weeks ago. And that was to look at extracurricular activities, and I'll define that later, and parking permits. And so I'll, I'll talk about each one individually. But the Board of Education, B. Earls, uh, was a Supreme Court decision in 2002 that really framed that this would, is allowable um, under uh, current um, law, or, or their, at least their decision on that case. Um, there is also a case out in New Jersey that tested the par parking permit threshold. Um, but again, I wanted to give some context to the legality of this decision. Uh, this is a draft policy, and it is independent of the vendor selection process. One of the things that occurred at that work session was we had a vendor come to the work session and talk a little bit about the process. And I know several of you in the room sent us information about that particular vendor. Um, this policy is vendor agnostic, so we're, we're talking specifically about the draft policy right now. Um, this, the vendor selection will be a separate decision. Extracurricular activities. For the purpose of this policy, it is defined as uh, an, a 
person that is a participant in an extracurricular activity that must maintain academic eligibility in order to participate, which falls into the OHS, OHSAA guidelines, and or a competitive activity that does not associate a grade with participation. The bright line that was drawn by the Supreme Court was that you cannot institute a random drug testing program if there is a grade associated with the activity. Uh, because obviously uh, compulsory education is a requirement. So uh, that is the definition that we're using. So there, there is a list that we've provided of what would be the athletic and non-athletic activities that would fall under this um, particular policy. The policy that was presented, it has a preseason test. Um, I think most of the school districts that have a random student drug testing program have not taken the next approach. The results of that preseason test would only go to parents. Okay, It would not go to the school district. Um, prior to the season or activity, um, then after that preseason test occurs, they, we would start a random testing protocol, which would be a random generator uh, that would uh, test a certain percentage of the population of students that were in the pool. Those results um, would go to the parents and the district in this, prop, in this policy. So really our, the goal, or at least the thought of the board at the time, was to really empower parents with that information first to hopefully intervene prior to any future um, positive results. Uh, the, the, the policy stipulates that if there is a, a positive test result, that the prevention-oriented consequences would be that if you participate in drug or alcohol treatment programs that are outlined in the policy or uh, stipulated in the guidance department that the student could um, reduce the penalty from 50% uh, to 25% of the season. Again, we want to incentivize students to seek help and support the parents to um, engage in that process fully. Uh, so that is the current policy that is uh, proposed under extracurricular activity. Parking permit. Um, we have roughly 350 parking spaces in the school district or at the high school, middle school, high school complex. Um, there is currently a permitting process where a student who has their license um, is permitted to su submit for a permit and get a designated location on school property. Um, that, what we would do is embed this policy into that permitting process. It would require a pre-permit test and the results would only go to parents. Again, this is informational and given to the parents only. Uh, those students that are engaged in the parking permit process would then also be included into the random testing pool. Uh, the random testing results uh, would then go to the parents and to the district that mirrors the, um, the extracurricular activities. Okay, and then if there is a positive test, there is no scaffolding under this policy currently. You, they are removed from the parking privilege. So it is, um, I, for lack of a better term, one and done um, type of policy currently. So that is the parking permit, which is a separate policy decision that the board can enact. But it does, um, we have in the past charged for the parking permit over the recent past we have not uh, we would institute a fee for the parking permit moving forward and it would be a way to offset the cost for all of the testing to occur uh, again not wanting to utilize district resources for that purpose uh, but understanding there will be some investment of district finance uh, financial resources um, next steps there is a board meeting on May 22nd. It is the second reading and proposed vote at this time. Um, but the board is going to obviously engage in public comment or listen to public comment right now, not engage. Um, listen to public comment right now. It will be a, a discussion of uh, a board discussion point and then um, 
any tweaks can be made between now and then for the uh, policy to be read again for the second time. So, board members, any questions about what I've shared with the community at this point? Um, since it's a um, discussion, uh, if it is our board discussion, should we just hold on to our thoughts and then actually do it all yes, at that point? Yes, that would be appropriate. Let me clarify one thing. Is there a component of self-reporting in the proposed plan? Yeah. So we have always had a self-report component um, that if a student makes a poor choice on the weekend and they go come into the administration and said, you know, I made a bad decision this weekend, I'd like to report. They, they can report without any consequence. That's always been in place. And um, that would also occur here. Uh, but again, if, if you're self-reporting right pro, uh, prior to um, the, the potential consequence of a second uh, confirmed positive, then you're, you're probably not falling into that category of a self-report. Parents, if they have a child that is um, gets a positive report, they can engage the school district without any penalty. Um, that would be kind of the same uh, approach of a self-report. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. And I'm going to close that so that yes. you're not blind. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That would be a good thing. Um, briefly, before we get to public comment, we have two brief um, um, board reports. Um, Tom is so brief. Um, first, Russ is going to um, update us on the economic sustainability conversation. Um, in the Thank you. Um, now that we've teed up the other discussion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, for those who, who aren't aware, the economic sustainability discussion uh, arose really after the last levy campaign of about five years ago. Uh, you may recall that it, the levy to fund the schools was narrowly passed by approximately 50 votes. The board uh, engaged in discussions thereafter about what we might do to address long-term economic sustainability within the schools with the re recognition, as you may have derived from Mr. Sobel's uh, report, that while we have a $30 million budget, 80 to 85 percent of our costs are in human costs. That is salaries, uh, Health care costs and then uh, energy and electricity, uh, fuel and electricity, excuse me. Those costs are difficult to control uh, as we go forward. And yet, Granville is different than most districts in the state in that more, almost more than 80% of, uh, of our schools are, the burden for funding our schools falls on residential taxpayers as opposed to a larger commercial base because we simply don't have that larger commercial base here. So we started the discussion here at the, at the district about what we might do to address that problem. We became aware that similar discussions were happening at the township trustee level and at the village council level and in fact at the GRD. Uh, and through some collaboration, communication, all of those groups came together and appointed a joint committee to really study opportunities for uh, bolstering the commercial base here in the community, uh, finding ways to bring in businesses that are desirable, that would fit within our community, that would help to uh, bolster the tax base and, um, and in some ways ease the burden of residential taxpayers. The, the most recent result is that we commissioned a study, uh, thanks to the, to the village council and the township trustees, uh, we commissioned a study to identify all developable parcels, residential and commercial, within, uh, within our boundaries. We identified uh, issues with respect to that development, utilities and zoning and, and the like, and recommendations were made. That will come back to the uh, Economic Sustainability Committee, which is comprised of members of the Village Council, the Township Trustees, the GRD, and Mr. Miller and myself on behalf of the board, and we'll continue that discussion. And we will um, hopefully be able to come to the community at some point with a unified uh, approach uh, and suggestion for how we might uh, really identify the best opportunities to, uh, to help offset some of the increasing tax base, uh, increasing tax burden on residential property. Great. And you wanted to give a brief update from the yep. GEF. Yep. The Grenville Education Foundation just met last Thursday and uh, approved over $10,000 in spring grants, which is fantastic that this uh, community-based charitable organization can make a big difference. And uh, I can't announce all the grants now because the staff members haven't been made aware, but there are things like we heard about the uh, Science Olympiad team, which was formerly uh, funded by the Granville Education Foundation. 
Uh, this spring cycle, we also partnered with uh, Music Boosters um, on one of the grants, and I think that's a great example of collaboration amongst our support organizations. Another important piece of collaboration uh, between the Athletic Boosters and the Music Boosters and the Granville Education Foundation now is partnering in our concession sales at all of our, uh, our, our events. And by supporting that, both in terms of labor and things like that, and receiving the, the revenue from the concessions, um, it's important that a piece of that goes back to support uh, academics as well as uh, music and, and our, our sports. Um, and I think I do want to just make one final comment as a shout out and thanks to three uh, retiring board members from the Granville Education Foundation, uh, Peg Betts, uh, Francis Ehrman, who's a third grade teacher, and also Amy Mock, are, uh, their terms are uh, ending this, uh, this year. So thanks to them and uh, thanks to all those who support the Granville Education Foundation. It makes a huge difference for, uh, for our schools. Okay, we have now um, reached the part of the agenda, which I assume most of you are here for. Um, it's time for public comment. If you would like to address the board, please come to the microphone, state your name and address, and you can speak for up to three minutes. I will be timing people, so don't take offense to it. It's just to expedite the process. What information do you need for me? Name and name. Michelle Lerner, 234 North Pearl Street in Granville. So um, I actually, it was not my intent to speak, um, <laughs> but I would, I would like to make a suggestion to the school board that in the name of engaging your community members, which I know is your goal, um, that you consider restructuring your agendas so that public comment actually comes at the beginning of your agenda. Um, at Village Council, I serve on Village Council, um, our public comment comes after commendations and things like that, and we have, um, we have, a, we have a nice turnout and engagement. And in particular, this evening, um, we're at two hours now before the public has had an opportunity to comment, and some of your uh, community members are students, and they have precious little time for waiting. Not that any of the reports that you had tonight weren't worth listening to. They all were, but Thank you. Thank for students who have schoolwork, um, getting them engaged and involved is, is critically important. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ted Burzak. I live on 107 Shape Place, and I have uh, one simple uh, point. Uh, I agree with much of uh, uh, Mr. Brown's presentation. I think the school has an interest in educating our students about uh, law and illegal drugs and the negative consequences of using those drugs. What I would like you, the board to consider is the educational dimension of the policy itself. This is what I think the policy itself teaches our sons and daughters and students. It teaches them that in order to participate in extracurricular activities, they must be willing to submit to a degrading test that violates their body, their bodily integrity, uh, that's administered by authority whenever authority deems that's necessary. Now, perhaps you think that I'm uh, overblown individualist rhetoric, that this, that this test is not uh, degrading or a violation of bodily integrity. And so I would like to, if I would like the uh, school board to consider educating the public that that is in fact incorrect and by, by agreeing to uh, a similar test for themselves before every school board meeting. My name is Dr. Jonathan Maskett, uh, 420 North Pearl Street in Granville. Um, I've been an education professional for about 30 years of my life. Um, and I would say some of my research touches on these sorts of issues, I'd very much like the board to rethink this ill-conceived proposal to submit our students to random drug testing. Um, I very much agreed with much of what Mr. Brown said at the beginning when he talked about education being the primary goal, and I thought reaching out to parents and engaging us in these processes and reaching out to children and educating them sounded great, and then it all became about punitive measures and surveillance and punishment. And I'm not convinced that those are really integral with education because education is about trust and growth and development and giving our students and our children the opportunity 
to learn and grow and develop and maybe make mistakes somewhere along the way and not see those mistakes as having nasty consequences. And surveillance, surveillance is what we do with prisoners. And it's about mistrust and keeping people where they are. Because if we subject them to random drug testing, what we're saying to them is, well, you passed this time, but we still don't trust you because we're gonna trust you again. And if you pass that time, we still won't trust you. We'll test you again and we'll never trust you. We'll never trust you. And that's really not the message we wanna send. Because let's be honest about this. Drugs, including alcohol, are an integral part of adult life. And I'd be willing to go on a, out on a limb and guess that at least 80% of us in this room consume drugs every day. And this policy also impedes on the rights of parents. Under Ohio law, it is my right as a parent to give my child alcohol and tobacco whenever I want. And if you subject my child to testing, you are impinging on my rights. You're not making me a partner in this plan. You are alienating me. And you're saying, you may not raise your child as you wish to raise your child. I think there are probably many others who would agree with me that the way to get students, our children to see that alcohol is part of adult life is to expose them to it in adult situations, to let them try our drinks, to see what things taste like. My son's never been drunk, but he's tried a lot of different drinks over the years. And I'm allowed, I could go out and buy him drinks in a bar. I can buy him cigarettes, I can buy him cigars. And your policy won't let me do that. And it will impinge what I think is the right way for him to learn about responsible use of these drugs that he's going to use as part of his adult life. And finally, if the goal of these policies is to say, well, students who show up for activities having used drugs or alcohol will endanger the other participants, that might be true. Although it's hard for me to imagine what the danger would be to the participants in robotics club or student government if somebody happened to show up drunk or high. But this policy of random drug testing won't only catch students when they show up drunk or high. If they get out, if they go out and drink on Friday night, let's think, let's say, I'll get 20 friends and their kids together. And under Ohio law, we can get as drunk as we want. And then on Monday, they're all dead sober, they're ready to go for school, and you make them pee in a cup. And those traces of alcohol show up in their system. They've endangered no one. But you've really taught them a good lesson about turning the Board of Education into the Board of Corrections. Bryn, 592 Greenwood Loop. Um, so, Bryn Hendrickson, sorry. Um, I just want to come at this from a high schooler's perspective because I'm currently a junior at Granville. And the only thing I'm an expert on is my peers, really, because I'm constantly around them. And I promise you, this will not work because I have not heard anyone say, well, if this was implemented, I would stop using. I've heard countless people say that they will not get parking passes and will find a different way to school. I've heard so many people say that they would stop doing their extracurriculars just so that they can keep doing things on the weekend, not even going to school like this. I just promise you that so many people will find ways around it or will quit doing basic things that you go to school to do just so, just so that they can have a little bit of freedom, which is what all teenagers really want. They just want the freedom to do small things or nothing at all or just the freedom to not have to pee on a plastic stick to be able to do Spanish club or youth in government or just really basic things that you kind of need to grow up and go to college and have experience. So that's all I'm really an expert on. We can talk about you know the policy itself or economics or the legality of it, but all I really know is that this just won't work from the perspective of a teenager. So thanks. My name is Vince Galoni. I live at 3232 Canyon Road. I've lived in Granville now for about 14 years, and my business has been associated with Granville for more than 40 years. I have two children that graduated from Granville several years ago. Uh, the last nine years, I was the head baseball coach here at Granville, and for two years before that, I was a middle school coach. 
Uh, last year I served on the committee that was put together to look into the pros and cons of whether random drug testing would work here. We obviously have a big problem. Uh, do we need random drug testing? Yes, we do, absolutely. Will it work? Yeah, it will, absolutely. And here's the reasons why I think it works. I looked at all the, the, uh, the pages and all the books and all the surveys and all the charts that they gave us, and quite honestly, they were pretty inconclusive. So here's the only way I know that it works. And the only way I know it works is by me asking my players. I'm not talking about current players. I'm talking about graduates, kids that have been out of school two years, four years, six years, that work for me in the summer, that know me as an adult and me know them as an adult. And I ask them the question. And here's the question, here's what they tell me. Yeah, it'll work, Coach, because it's going to be a choice between do I want to play baseball or do I want to drink or, or do drugs? And right now, they can do both. But if you do random drug testing, it makes them force, forces them into an issue that they have to make a choice. And most of my guys said, you know, for the most part, Coach, yeah, we know it all goes on. We know you're not naive what goes on. The results say 50%, you know, so we know it happens. But guess what? If there is random drug testing, we're going to make a choice. And most of the guys are going to make the choice to play baseball rather than getting a chance to get caught. It's not about punishment. It's about prevention. Um, I think it also helps the students. I mean, one of the big things that we looked at is, the, is that a lot of it has to do with peer pressure. And for a kid just to be able to say no, because you know what? I don't want to take the risk. I'm at a party. I don't want to take a risk of getting drunk having alcohol in my system, drugs in my systems, because I might get tested Monday. And you know what, I got a ball game. I got a team I got to help support. I got a team that's behind me. So now I can't do it. It's an easy out for those kids. It's a good excuse for those kids. And I think it also helps the parents and the coaches. I can tell you for the 11 years that I've been associated at the school, it's only been a few times, but a few times I just felt handcuffed. That I really didn't know what I could do. That I had a situation that again, rumors, innu innuendos, no proof. But I really think that having that drug test program in place really gives you quite a tool, you know, that really can, that can help you out. Um, so um, the other thing is this. I obviously know there's a lot of cost involved. You know, there's going to be a community that's going to be divided. But in reality, it comes down to this. If only one child, if we only save one child, is it worth all the cost? Is it all worth what we get through? And my, and my answer, it's obviously yes. Thank you. Valley Court. Uh, I'm a mom of two in the school district. I wanted to give my opinion on the suspicionless drug testing proposal based on my own personal experience when my high school began a very similar drug testing program in 2003. The whole goal of this proposal is to stop kids from doing drugs. What I experienced and observed as a result of the drug testing was not a decline in drug use. The students didn't do less drugs. They just did less extracurricular activities so they wouldn't have to be drug tested. With more free time on their hands, the students could spend more time doing drugs. Instead of being involved in clubs or groups where they'd be enhancing their skill set, making them more prepared for the world that they'd be entering after graduation. I knew kids who quit playing in the school band, something they were extremely passionate about because of drug testing. One of my classmates, she declined her invitation into the National Honor Society because of drug testing. What randomized drug testing did at my school was further isolate kids who were already turning to drugs for whatever reason. Segregating them and pushing them closer to the users of heavier drugs. My school also did drug testing to the kids who wanted parking permits. What happened there was that kids simply stopped parking at school and instead drove and parked in a nearby parking lot off school property where, as if in direct response to the ever increasing restraints that the school was attempting to put upon its students, they got high more and more often. Eventually, a nearby school district was sued because the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to drug test students where there was no hard evidence suggesting there was a drug problem. 
That ruling implied that suspicionless drug testing of students was considered unconstitutional in the state of Pennsylvania. The school board could not justify the use of taxpayer dollars to try to defend a program that had little to no chance if taken to court. And so, in 2015, after over a decade of testing about 10 kids a week at 15 bucks a test, that's at least $54,000 in taxpayer money, the school district voted to rescind the drug testing program. That's a high price tag for less than desirable results, and I hope we can learn from others' experience and vote no to the proposal. lived in Granville for over a third of a century, and I've been an educator for about half a century. And I want to say first and foremost, I do not envy you having to deal with this problem. People are dying from drugs, students potentially could die from drugs, the consequences are dire. But I would agree with the comments of everybody except Mr. Galoni, but I would have to say that his arguments are compelling. We wouldn't have this sort of meeting tonight. We wouldn't have had to have so many meetings if the problem weren't that complex and weren't that compelling. But quite frankly, this proposal creeps me out. My being creeped me out, my being creeped out is not gonna offer you any arguments. The arguments I would appeal to are, number one, as an educator, and number two, as an American. Uh, as an ed educator, uh, of course, I had to have control. I had to exercise power. To, to make the class run efficiently. But I have to tell you, I got the best results. I got the, the magic that education can be when the emphasis was less on control and more on respect. And I would walk into the classroom and I would always be explicit. You're in a class of mine, it just so happens that I taught French, it just so happens that I taught at school where French was required, and half the students would be slouched scowling on the first day, their body language telling me, I dare you to teach me French, I dare you to make me like French. And I would tell them, that's fine. I understand, there's an argument that can be had there. I don't care how you feel towards me or towards the course, I respect that. As long as you don't interfere with the educational process, that's fine. And I'm not seeing that spirit of inviting the students to be open to themselves because I'm not distracting them with power. And your, your language, I don't want to make points that are too subtle, but I see, for instance, the language that parents or guardian, guardian must consent. Well, as I understand consent, it's an exercise of free will. You can't must consent. I think what you need to be more honest, more straightforward, and more clear is to say you must accept. And I think once you put that language in, you'll start seeing or at any rate feeling a little bit more the problem in this sort of proposal. And so as an educator, I would say this spirit isn't compatible with the best that can happen. And yes, the students are going to leave school. And they will not always be the sort of control that you're exercising if you're going to educate them for that world that awaits them. I think you need to move the spirit towards a more benevolent and open approach. The sort of approach I saw in some of your proposals about education. And then my feelings as an American. I volunteered for service in this country. Uh, I have a commission, I had a commission, and I have an attachment to the Constitution. And I see it as a document of great potential. We haven't realized the American dream, we're working on it. But there are certain values incorporated in it that I think ought to be brought to play in your decisions. And I'm concerned about the Fourth Amendment which, and, and realize that the Constitution would not have survived, would not have worked, it wouldn't be living in the world we live had it not been for those amendments. The Fourth Amendment says the people shall not be constrained in their right uh, to their person, their houses, their property, or their effects. The first word is persons shall not be constrained in their right to the free exercise of the person. And this document suggests that that 
that spirit. And I'm not going to argue about the letter because the complications of what you're about to more than empty addresses that I'm talking about that spirit. That as an American, I respect the right in viability of the person. The person as an American ought not to be subject to unreasonable search and seizure. And I'm not saying that the issue isn't complicated. The issue isn't complicated. I'm not saying that there's a component of that to get the spirit straight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. I'm Jen Kanegi, 2584 Upland View Court. I'm a mom, I have a fifth grader here, nurse of 23 years, and we just moved to the district in January. Uh, we moved here for the great community support that we saw through the triathlon group that we joined. And um, the parent involvement, parents are so involved here, it was really different from where we came from. Um, and the educational opportunities, we've heard nothing but great things about Granville. But I came here tonight to voice my opposition to the proposed drug testing policy, and I don't make that decision lightly. My sister is a recovering heroin addict, and we talk openly about bad choices in our home, and we talk about the consequences. We also talk about the legalization of marijuana in many states, the 23% drop in opioid use in states that have legalized, and the medicinal breakthroughs with the cannabinoid use, especially with veterans that have PTSD, and the work uh, with kids with seizures, and then the cancer treatments. Um, the policy as proposed seems very punitive to my husband and I. Students are tested solely because they want to participate in extracurriculars or they want to obtain a parking pass, um, not because they were smoking. They were caught smoking under the bleachers. This to us seems very evasive, as even the police department need probable cause to pull you over in a vehicle. I do not think this policy fosters a sense of trust or independence in our kids. My husband is a pilot and we are both subject to random screens, which at times can make you feel very demoralized as the people stand right by the door. Um, they listen to you actually pee in the cup and there's a temperature gauge on there so it, you already feel like you're in trouble for something. And I imagine most teenage girls would be mortified and I know my daughter is only 11 but if she was on her period she would probably absolutely die. So that I think is very, um, something we need to think about the kids when we're asking them to do this. My husband was in stage and theater crew and he smoked cigarettes in high school. Uh, I asked him what he would have done. Had he been tested and kicked out? And he said probably a lot worse than smoking cigarettes. The drug of choice at my high school was Mad Dog 2020 and Old Milwaukee Beer. And I doubt that what we consume Friday and Saturday night were detectable in our urine Monday morning. So I question wasting tax dollars on tests that could possibly be ineffective. And it's not that we want to see kids smoking under the bleachers or drinking on Friday and Saturday night. We just feel that there's a better way to deal with it. Um, I've reviewed the product results. I've reviewed the policies. And if this was about the kids' well-being and safety, any positive test should result in immediate counseling or rehab. And the parking policy does not require a completed program until a year later when requesting a parking pass from what I understand. I found a great article in the Washington Post and it says school drug tests, costly and effective and more common than you think. The American Academy of Pediatrics put out a statement and um, they basically said that the uh, substance abuse services in schools were effective but they oppose widespread implementation of drug testing as a means of achieving substance abuse intervention. So, my husband and I agree there's a better way to address drug use. We feel district dollars would be better spent on an anti-drug climate in the school as this has been proven more effective than testing. We also believe dollars should be directed at mental health awareness and anti-bullying programs instead of mandatory testing. Just today I read about two teenage suicides in the Columbus area. I think parents and schools need to look at why kids are using, self-medicating, and help parents gain the tools to raise healthy kids with coping skills other than substances to carry them through life.
is 13 and has some pretty serious mental health issues. He has been in and out of the hospital and residential treatment for the last year. And during this time, he has been subject constantly to violations of his autonomy. He has been forced to take drug tests. He has been given shots while in the middle of psychotic rage. And he does not trust people. And while obviously this is not to that level, it is imposing on our kids this, the fact that we don't trust them and that we are going to require them to pee in a cup. As a mother, that is completely opposite what I have taught my boys all of their lives. If somebody wants to hug you and you feel uncomfortable, say no. If somebody you want to hug says no, respect that. And this policy doesn't give our children the opportunity to say no. And so we can't teach them both things and mean it. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Laura Masterson. I'm a junior at Fairville High School. I uh, live on 2920 Bristol Road. I definitely think there is an issue, obviously, in our high school, but it's no different from a lot of other high schools. And I think this kind of policy, if it had results that were worth it, we would have it already. Like, we would probably, if this were the fix all, cure all, like two high schoolers um, abusing alcohol and drugs, it would have already been created. I mean, like, this is not. Um, a super original idea and I also agree with what some of the other people have said about it kind of um, infringes upon your I, I guess rights it's not letting you have control over your own body it's invading your privacy and it's already and Granville is a very um, we're told how great we are because of our test scores and how we should be so proud of ourselves and then we're treated like I guess, kind of like prisoners in a way, like how we um, would be subjected to this. And it's not um, really giving you liberty over like your own choices. And um, it's just, I think it's a very harsh policy. And I also think that there could be more done to prevent this behavior, like if um, starting younger, because now most of kids my age, they already, we think that we are right. Like if you tell us something, we're gonna be like, no, I'm right. And um, I think if you start at a younger age teaching more about um, drug abuse, like we were told, no, don't do it, but we weren't told the reason why people do it. Like, oh, it's fun. You weren't taught how to socially drink, like in moderation. It was just, don't do it. And it's kind of like, you need to, Learn, you need to teach kids that bad things are going to happen, but you need to learn how to do things in moderation. So. Hi, I'm Ava Gunnar, 47 Mental Drive. I was on the committee in the fall also with Coach Baloney and um, a lot of other people, including Mr. Durst and uh, Mr. Jared and everything. And basically what I got from this proposal is I only see potential benefits. I don't exactly see potential downfalls. Um, if, it, if the concern is that it wastes taxpayers' dollars, but it has the potential to save students' lives or help better their futures, then I don't see how um, you can really put a price on someone's life. I think that a lot of the points that have been made are valid in that um, I understand that it, it can seem to infringe on people's rights, but I'd like to point out that Parking on school grounds or competing in extracurricular activities and sports is a privilege and it's not a right that anyone has by going to a public school. Um, I think that, that might be different if you're just drug testing everyone at random, but if a student's asking the school for something, then the school can be able to test them in return, I think. They don't, I don't think that's a 
bad thing to uh, do for someone who's asking to park on school grounds or compete in extracurricular activities. Um, that's all I really have to say, but I just don't see how, I mean, we've never done this before, so if we give it a shot and it doesn't work, we don't have to keep doing it. But if we never try, then we'll never know if it could have helped lessen the, the sad statistics that we've seen previously. So I don't really see why we wouldn't at least give it a shot, even if it does waste money in some people's opinions, it could save lives. And I think every parent in this room and every student in this room and everyone who loves anyone in this room would say that you can't put a price on someone in a student's life. I don't think that that's fair. My name is Kathy Dollar Farzak and I'm with the 107 Shape and Place in Brandon. Um, and I wrote to a few board members today thinking I wouldn't be able to speak tonight, but the meeting went so long, here I am. So this is different than what I wrote. Um, I, I, I want to talk about a few different things. First is the inherent logic of the actual text of the proposal itself. The, the core causal factor in the proposal is that um, substance abuse, uh, drug, alcohol, tobacco place students in doing that place themselves and others at heightened risk of physical harm. And that's the full causality in the proposal to my reading as, as justifying it. Um, later in the proposal, it says that a student who, on the athletic side, a student who has tested positive is required to practice with the team. That seems to be an inherent contradiction right there that even though the abuse for which they have been caught has occurred, they're required to practice with the team. So I think there's some inherent logical tensions in the proposal itself. The second one addresses tobacco use writ large. Um, potential harm to an individual from tobacco use is clear and it's not good. Neither is a diet of you know, Mountain Dew and Fritos for life. These are bad things, but a student who is using tobacco is, is not inflicting any harm whatsoever on their other teammates unless their coaches are allowing them to smoke at the actual event, which is a whole other issue, I think. And so there are inherent logical tensions in the proposal itself that, that need to be worked through if you want to actually implement this as policy. A second point is simply, um, I'm an education administrator. There's the athletic director's title is all over this policy. You're going to be adding a lot to the athletic director's job. Does the athletic director not have a pretty full job as it is? So the costs are not just to taxpayers, but also to whatever sort of administrative processes. Clearly somebody's gotta be doing this work or we're gonna need another AD or something. But most important, um, I'd like to reflect on what Professor O'Keefe talked about the spirit of, of the proposal. Um, I'm just so heartened by the words, the work that is going on in terms of educating our students about the pervasive and pernicious drug culture. But, there is a tension between some of the things Superintendent Brown was referring to that, you know, FERPA rights mean we will never indicate which students have transgressed. The students are all going to know, and you know they're going to know. When a student is cut who's been seemingly, you know, on the team and all of a sudden is gone, they're going to know there's a transgression. The school won't have violated FERPA, but the damage to the student is the same. But even more so than that, um, in, I think, uh, Superintendent Brown's very compelling remarks, you talked about we want to empower students. This policy empowers our students through diminishing them to an institution. And the rights that are being violated certainly are the students' rights, but as a parent, I'm gonna be biased and say my rights as a, as a mother are being more violated. I'm trying to raise a child that trusts children, that trust in the institutions that they're going to grow up being a part of, that they're going to be a civil member engaging in. When you create a document that says, I must consent, you're violating my right to raise my child with that eye towards those institutions. So I'm definitely opposed to the policy. I think that's clear. But I do have a question. Why not, if you just want to try it, have an opt out? If a whole, whole bunch of us opt out, that's going to tell you a lot. And if hardly anybody opts out, it's going to tell the few of us who do opt out a lot too. That seems a much better way to go. Uh, my name is Seth Trim Parker, 439 West College Street. Um, like many of you here, I wear many hats around here. I've lived in the community about 13 years. 
Uh, as a parent, I, I try to raise kids uh, with an eye towards making good decisions for themselves, and this would force me to take that decision away from them, and I don't like that. As a taxpayer, I like uh, money being spent for uh, being spent wisely. I don't see this as a wise spending of the money. I think the money, if, if we're concerned about our students, we're concerned about educating them, we're concerned about the use of substances, it could be used much more wisely than putting it towards people being in cup. Um, but I really want to focus on, uh, I spent a lot of time as an educator, and one of the things that I realize about education, a lot of important things happen in the classroom, but a lot of really important things happen outside the classroom in these extracurriculars. Uh, I used to teach high school before I, I'm a faculty at Denison now. And I was a coach of the cross country team, so I could, I could appreciate your coaching comments. Um, one of the things I realized when I heard stories of my, my, uh, my runners uh, possibly using uh, drinking on the weekend or something, I was damn glad they were still on that team because I still have my finger on them. If anything started to go south, if anything started to fall apart in their lives, I was there, the team was there. They were part of something. This policy would put a barrier to that kind of experience for many students, whether it's psychological, like, oh, I might get caught, I better step back, I can't do it, or they get caught and they're kicked off. That is directly in opposition to what I think this school board wants for their students, what this school district wants for their students. So that just really doesn't sit well with me. And the last thing is I'm a psychologist, and so one of the things that I, 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 I focus on is reasoning, uh, decision making, and such. And you, you may not know this, although if you have children of your own, you do, at the age of 16, 17, they're not fully developed in their decision making capabilities. Uh, neurologically, the pathways in the prefrontal cortex are still in development. More importantly though, the information that they is important to them and how they use that information in decision making is different. So although we might as parents think it's a clear decision, drink, you don't play football, smoke, you can't be in the theater. To them, it's not, that's not the decision they're making. They're making a decision that they, they can't see that far in the future. They can't think about the implications that far. And you're not going to convince them to by implementing a policy like this. It's through education, it's through experiences. It's a through, well, the, the literature, if you want to go to the research, says that for teenagers, one of the things they really learn about is making a bad decision and working through it. And this policy is not part of that. This policy is about having things taken away for bad decisions. And it's not the kind of information, the kind of structure that the students need at that point. So despite what hat I'm wearing, whether I'm a parent, a community member, a psychologist, an educator, I just don't see this policy as a positive step forward. I love a lot of the other components that Jeff was talking about. I fully understand, I mean, I'm concerned. I have two kids who are in their teenage years. I'm concerned. But I'm going to do what I can as a parent. And that's what I'm going to do. And I don't, I don't I think this won't help. Hi, Brooklyn Rosen, 326 North Pearl Street. And um, when I first read about this, my first reaction was like the gentleman before me was, as a teenager, peers are an important part of your life, but most importantly, sometimes some of the adults and the teachers are a part of your life. And kids are going to mess up. But sometimes uh, when something's bad going on in your life and kids are going to have something bad happen at some point, your peers are who you go to or the adult or a coach or a teacher is someone who you go to. And if you lose that because you made a bad decision, then you don't have that support system anymore. And where are you supposed to go? Like back when I was in high school, I didn't have a home support system. so. My complete support system was my peers and teachers and counselors who really lifted me up and got me where I needed to go. And the thought of possibly even losing that because of a bad decision just makes me almost cringe because I can't imagine what would have happened to me if I had not had that support system or I had that support system possibly taken away from me just because of a bad decision. Um, and then as a parent, 
I started reading everything, and then I started thinking as the more specifics of controlled substances. A lot of kids are on controlled substances. If your pediatrician writes a prescription for your children, which a lot of our children get prescriptions for this for, you have to go get a piece of paper, go to the pharmacy, they have to fill it. So that would come up positive on a test. So at this point, it's gonna come up positive in your child's test. You are then gonna to have to go to your pediatrician, I'm assuming, have them write a letter to say, why you're taking this medication and then give it to you guys or the school system. And again, that to me is like, okay, now we're hitting HIPAA laws. So that medication may be something that was part of our family and only we wouldn't need them to know and you guys didn't need nobody yet. And now you do. And so you'd have to do that every time they tested. And it would be a violation, I think, of that kid or even me as a parent of what decision I've made every time we had to test. So I, that was a question of mine is, if they get tested and that comes up, you know, I, I didn't see anything in here that specified that. So that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Th
find some better data gather, gathering methods and, and, and build up some data before you implement a very costly <coughs> program that doesn't um, necessarily demonstrate that it's been effective. Thanks. Anybody else like to address the board at this time? to this because it creates a, it fosters an environment of resent towards administration because students feel like their rights are being violated no matter if they are using drugs or alcohol or not because teenagers are defensive in nature. And I'd also like to bring up that, uh, like I've heard, I've heard multiple comments, you know, the, peop, the only students that are voicing opposition to this, you know, are like potheads, which I think is, I find very offensive because people want, you know, student activism, but then the moment a student uh, shares their opinion, they're immediately dismissed as being inferior. Um, so, yeah, I would just like to strongly consider the board to uh, overturn this decision. Hi, I'm Chris Compton. I live on 123 West College Street. Um, like Ruby, like I was debating in my head coming up here just because I was worried that like because like my French teacher was just sitting in front of me and I was worried that like I would get the opinion that like I did drugs and stuff like that, but I just, like Ruby, I feel that it violates a personal right that we all have. And it's not like a written right, but it's, it's just, you can feel sort of violated when you have to pee in a cup and then get tested even if you aren't using drugs. I was also confused as to where the suspicion plays because it's sort of similar to um, What's the word that I'm looking for? Profiling. Like it's sort of similar to profiling in nature where you are looking at a student and you could assume that they are doing drugs and then test them even if they are completely clean in their system. And it was just running through my mind because I kept thinking and I sort of saw how it could be like similar. And so I was wondering if any of you have like something that would ease my mind on that or if you guys would like to acknowledge the fact that it's similar to profiling? Um, we probably we will try and address that when we have our board discussion. Um, um, and, um, I personally haven't thought about that, but um, it is something that we can do. Um, thank you. Alrighty, thank you. So um, to frame the board conversation, this has been an ongoing conversation for several years. Uh, you've heard feedback. 
is there any uh, modification or suggestion um, that you would like to make to the policy that I bring back in on May 22nd, if, if that is the board's desire? Um, there are two that I would suggest. One that we've talked about that we haven't placed in the policy, which would be a sunset clause. If we were to approve uh, a, some sort of uh, testing program, uh, it, it would be my preference, and I haven't told the board at all, it would be my preference that we would uh, automatically sunset it after a period of time, I would suggest three years, uh, so that it, uh, it comes up again, uh, it can be analyzed uh, in terms of efficacy, in terms of cost, in terms of impact, uh, and would ensure that that will remain the uh, item for discussion. So that, that's one suggestion I would make, and I don't, I don't typically do this this way, so I'm not sure what you know, the protocol is or what, what, how the board feels about that. So I'll throw out the other suggestion, too, and then people can consider or not. Uh, and, and we've had a little bit of conversation about that. So the test, the, the proposal that's uh, before us tonight calls for a preseason test, and I'm, I'm not speaking about the parking issue, I'm speaking only about the extracurriculars. It calls for a preseason test. So if you're a fall sports participant, there would be a date or more than one date where everybody in a, in a fall sport uh, goes in and submits to a test uh, and the results of the first test go only to parents, not to the school. And then after that, there's a random uh, testing program with of students, whether it's 10 or whether it's 30, I've not made any decision there. Um, the random testing takes place thereafter. I think setting aside, um, for the moment, uh, setting aside the discussion about the overall um, implications of a testing program, I think that a, a preseason test is both likely to be ineffective uh, and to be significant uh, challenge in terms of bringing in a lot of students uh, at a time in order to, to test. And I also think, and we've discussed this a little bit, um, you know, when the, when the data is set, um, I would suspect that, um, I would hope, that no one fails that test. Uh, I would hope no one would ever fail any of the tests that we administer, but certainly one that's as a set date, uh, and I don't want to create any sort of um, sort of false data around that. So my suggestion is that we eliminate the preseason test, and that we simply, uh, if the board so chooses to, to approve a testing program, that it just is a random testing program, uh, and random tests start whatever uh, we elect to, and students would be placed in a program so that everyone is not going to be tested preseason exam. And then again, the, the first round of testing uh, in the random test, the results would go only and exclusively to the parents and not to the school. Yeah. Okay. So eliminate the preseason, move to a random only, still parent gets the first report, and then there's a follow-up test that is part of they're automatically placed in the random pool it, 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 or is there well, or is it still randomized everybody's placed in a random pool if, i think what you reference is if if, if a if student there's a uh, it's a positive result which is actually negative but a positive right fails the test then yes um, they would go back into the testing they would automatically be tested again at some Okay. So it's which is similar to the current proposed policy, with the exception of moving the parent only test to a first test randomly during the school year and eliminating the preseason test. Eliminates the preseason test, which um, is a I think a logistical challenge. Uh, it would be an expense that I think is probably uh, it would be an expense. Other thoughts on that 
that particular issue. I have a couple of other questions that I'd like to ask the board and get your opinions on. So, any thoughts on? Or any th any other changes yeah. that you would like to see? This is the first read, and usually at the first read, where we make comments and change the policy, um, amongst other things we can discuss. But that is one one um, uh, reason for doing a first read. Um, I heard some some comments in the in the public comment section about profiling and whether you're testing students that you're suspicious of or not. Um, I, I'm not sure the legal background of that. Right. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that, or yeah. somebody I, kind of address I, I, why I'm, we've chosen this mechanism? I will tell you, I'm not an attorney, um, so I'm going to give that caveat right now. Um, but the Fourth Amendment is really the reasonable suspicion issue, and. Um, it prohibits us from just randomly testing students um, who are um, not uh, being um, accused in some way of, of violating the standard, okay? So, but the Supreme Court has ruled because it's a privilege, the suspicion clause or reasonable suspicion clause does not apply. Whether you agree or disagree, that's at least the standard that they created. Um, so it is is based more on the privilege versus right issue, not necessarily on the suspicion issue. Right. That's that's the foundation of their decision. Can can you address Mr. Compton's concern about profiling by giving a little more information about? how students would be selected for testing right. in a random right. test. So there, the, the administration will not have the ability to handpick and put students into the pool. Um, it, the, the vendor, whoever it is, would use a random, randomized process to select the pool. At least that's what all the vendors have said. Um, so it is not going to be, I think that kid's on drugs, I'm going to make them test. Um, so it would not be a profiling or a stereotyping scenario under what what has been proposed. Right. I have two questions. Yeah. The it just kind of says everywhere that this is just going to happen and it's just a random, regular basis. Why do we have a kind of working schedule of it's going to be every two weeks, every month? It's going to be five kids, twenty kids. Do we have or is that so? down the road the, the percentage has not been decided I think the board has to have that conversation it could be flexible um, where you test 10% one month and and 40% the next not sure what the board's uh, desire is on that but um, we at least administratively when we were thinking about the logistics of implementation we were thinking a monthly assessment Okay, I'm just wondering if that goes in this document or if that's a separate. It, it would, I would suggest that's probably a separate document. Separate document. Okay. Is that more of an administrative guideline? Exactly, administrative guideline. And then also throughout here, I think a lot of people are assuming this is a urine test, but nowhere does it specifically say this is a urine test. Right. The, so I, I don't know, and I know that we had talked about saliva tests. Yeah. But I don't think we can go to the hair test route, and I don't want this to be like an open document where suddenly we're all killed in a plane crash tomorrow and someone comes in and everyone's hair testing kids or things like that. So I don't know if that's something that can be. I, I, I think what I heard at the work session was um, a urine test. If a child can't produce a sample, then a saliva, saliva swab would be used so that that child isn't out of class for a long period of time. So I think those two are um, options that are available to the board if you so choose. And that should go in the stack. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the policy itself? I have a question. Have a question. So, um, a a member of the community referenced an opt out provision. Um, other suggestions have been opt in only, um, and we've discussed those as well. Is is there any desire for the administration to consider consider a parent opt in, out opt out provision on this policy? I 
It's an interesting thought. Okay. Maybe um, you need some more time to digest it. You're going to have um, close to a month, and then you'll have another dialogue about this. But I didn't mean to ask you, like, right off right. the bat, but, but it was an interesting um, su suggestion that we, hadn't yet that we have not considered yet or had conversation about. In some ways, I'd like to leave my comments to the end because it's been no secret. And if you look at every, all of our discussions, I do not support this policy at all. So I think if you would like to continue the discussion about the policy itself, then you can do that, and then I can make some. I, I was going to speak to the to the opt out. Uh, I'm fundamentally not opposed. It's no secret that. Despite the enormous respect that I have for you, that you and I have different views on this. Uh, and I have been generally in favor of a testing program as part of an overall comprehensive approach to preventing substance use. Uh, and I hate the fact that it involves peeing in the cup. But until they invent a temporal standard for the forehead, that's, uh, that's what we're left with. Uh, the opt out is interesting in two ways. There was a comment made that I, that I, uh, I found quite interesting. It's, it's you know, be a, an interesting way to sort of test uh, or receive data uh, on how uh, folks view the program. And you know, I think that's a, a very valid point. I would suggest if we look at an optional program and given the concerns that have been expressed about sort of suspicionless testing, that there's no reason to uh, impose an obligation on someone to opt out, which may subject them to some suspicion, I would make it an opt-in if we were going to do it. I'm not suggesting that, that that's the way I want to go. I'm not suggesting that it could work, but I, I think it's I think there's some merit to that discussion as an alternative, but I would favor opt-in over opt-out. Others' perspective? I think it's also yeah. important to note, yeah. because of Sunshine Laws, this is our only opportunity to actually have a public uh, or <laughs> a conversation where it's a back and forth between the administration yeah. and the governance team. So I think, you know, it may look awkward to them, but because we can't actually act as a body <laughs> unless we're sitting around these tables, um, it, it does make it somewhat clunky. So I apologize to put in putting you on the spot, but I'm, yeah. I'm just yeah. collecting feedback. Okay, relative to the opt-in possibility, we've looked at that and considered that, and there are organizations that specifically support those kinds of things. And I believe we've found that at other districts that have policies like that in place, it's a very small minority on the order of 10 or 15 percent of students who, or families who choose that option. So that's something to keep in mind, right? Um, if we're attempting to address a broader problem, whether that's as effective in some way um, as that. The other alternative that we've discussed before in our work session and so forth is all results only going to parents, right? Um, which, which again, we had considered and, and, and thought through as a possibility, but not one that's kind of part of the current policy. Because again, in that case, it didn't seem like it addressed some issues that, that many community members have expressed around the, the current status of substance abuse in our, in our students. And, um, so that's one that was also discussed mm -hmm. and, and so forth, but, yeah. I think you're right. The data we've seen is very minimal participation. Yeah. That's for a club. What if it were just completely parent opt-in and, you know, no club involved, you just had a parent say, I want my kid to be, and as per, per condition for my kid to participate in, and this is my decision as a parent, I want you to drug test my kid. I would probably be very similar to the Drug um, Free America Club, which has been, you know, tends to have little participation on them, um, from students. But um, that would be a completely parent um, decision. 
it would give students the out that they said that, you know, I can't do anything because my, um, my parent put me in the drug testing program. Just that uh, I would still have problems with that kind of a program, but um, it's another option. But at this time, I know we have to as far as the yet. policy is concerned that's in front of you, am I writing a clause that's either an opt-in or an opt-out? Or is the board attorney? As an alternative to what we're talking about, to vote on one or the other, or to replace what would to, we have to put in conjunction with um, the current policy, I think, as amended as you stipulated, potentially. I, I don't know that everybody agrees with the amendments right. that I suggested, but um. I think I would feel comfortable being able to take that idea and ask the larger community if I know we had public comment and that <coughs> idea wasn't there, so we we got public opinions one way. I, it would make me feel more comfortable if we could take that back and say, if you only had to opt in then what would you do? I don't. We did, we did actually survey that at the beginning of this process. And long, yeah, and, but and it seems interest has. 12% was, I think was the, now, it was not a scientific study. It was a small sample size. And I mean, from a credibility of a, a survey perspective. I'm just, trying to, just appease, try to, trying to appease, find a middle, right. a middle ground, right? Right. So. I'm not trying to suggest that, that I would that I'm willing to um, say I favor an opt-in over the policy we're talking about. Okay. All right. I, I don't mind us considering both and having a discussion about that. May also be clunky, but I, right. If, if others find that to be uh, useful, I'm okay with that. Uh, but as I, you know, I said at the top. This is not on that topic, but I know we have discussed this before, and I wonder if you could address one of the parents uh, was concerned about prescription drugs yeah. showing up in a test right. and was concerned about that information getting back to the schools when the parent had decided not to, to show it. Can you please clarify? Yes. So the, the conversations that I've had with vendors, um, Everybody has a medical, all the vendors have a medical review officer. So if there is a positive test, um, they send it to the medical review officer to um, determine if that's valid. And then um, that medical review officer contacts the parent and talks to them about is there a prescription medication for that. It never comes back to the school. It's between the medical professional that's associated with that vendor and it is not communicated in any way to the school district. Right. Thank you. So it's a medical professional hired by the vendor as a medical review officer. But that's still one of my fundamental yeah. issues with the policy at all, is that we're forcing families to reveal private health information to a health provider that they have not chosen. So the only way to get, if you're, and I'm, we have kids who are, have, who are on medications that will trigger a positive test. And the only way to clear a child from that is for you to then divulge to that medical officer who you have no, you have not had any opportunity to vet, you've had not any opportunity to have a discussion with, um, you have to divulge your child's prescriptions to that person. That is, reveal. Um, and that is correct. So I feel That's like accurate. we're forcing our families to make a decision between revealing personal health information to these medical providers, but ones they've not had a, any say in, or choosing to allow their kids to participate in um, extracurricular activities. Um, and I just don't think that that's a um, decision that we should be forcing on our parents. Also in this day and age, you know, also these, these providers say yes, we do all sorts of data security, but we know Target, Home Depot, all sorts of, um, computer systems have been hacked, and so there's no guarantee that 
a student's um, health information will be protected 100%. I mean, that's something that we can't guarantee. Um, and so that's one of the four things on my list of reasons why I am not supportive of this policy, but I think that's a particularly um, um, serious one. Um, okay. So, but that's yeah, yeah. just because of how the, you know, the procedure came up, but that is what would have to happen. That is correct. That's an accurate depiction of what vendors have said. Yeah. I don't think that that's something that we should be forcing on our families. Okay. Other thoughts? So, at this point, I think I'm coming back with a policy that has the sunset clause, which I believe already is included, but it's in the footnote. Um, and then the preseason pre test would be eliminated. It would be random only, parent only, unless a positive. And if positive, they have additional testing in the randomized process or a follow-up test that if that failed, then would go to the district. Is that accurate? Is second that failure. yeah, second failure? Okay. So and and all, all it, it's the same as the policy we've had. Yeah. Just to eliminate the preseason test. Okay. It makes it truly right. Okay. Is it still possible to kill the policy altogether? Yeah, well, the the. the, the, the we, do we, have, we have to bring it to a vote next next month at all. I'm just asking procedurally. That is a decision that the board can make whether to make a decision and vote on it or table it, which was done last year. So I think. The board needs to make a decision on moving forward and voting or tabling. I just would like to make um, two comments as to why I think we should table it. Okay. Um, you know, we've had lots of people present information to us. And at best, the research is mixed. But if you actually look at the most scientifically sound studies, the ones that are based on representative samples, it shows that drug testing doesn't make it. Right, um, And even if you want to take the anecdotal evidence from the small studies um, that show that there are some small decreases in marijuana use, those studies also show negative effects, like kids moving on to drugs that will go undetected in, in, in uh, random drug tests, drugs that are possibly more dangerous, synthetic drugs that can't be detected. So if you look at you know, the combined and you even want to you know, be generous and say the, the, the studies are, are mixed at best, we would never adopt a math curriculum or a language arts curriculum based on this evidence, right? So if we are gonna do evidence-based decision-making, I would say that the research would tell us that this is not um, something that we should be engaging in. My other opposition is that, um, amongst many things that have been said this evening, is that um, drug testing is not an educational program. And it doesn't teach our students anything other than to not do drugs because you might get caught. I would also argue that um, this program does not align with our core mission, which is learning for life. It does nothing to prepare students for making good choices when they are no longer our students. In fact, I would argue that by contributing to the creation of a more negative, distrustful school environment is actually detrimental to our core mission. It's also detrimental to the, our desire for students not to use drugs and alcohol because studies have shown that a positive school climate has a larger preventive effect on drug use than does drug testing. So based on all of these things, I still feel like it's, you know, I would rather not bring the drug test forward, I mean the drug policy forward because I think it's, it goes against our mission and the research doesn't support it. Okay. Um, and just to comment on the, but it could save a life, but it could also hurt a life. Because we know that these extracurricular activities are um, protective factors against drug use, and we're actually gonna be taking them away from the very people that will probably you know, 
benefit the most from them. Um, you know, it could save life, but it could also be very detrimental to other, you know, lives. So it's kind of a balance, right? So, you know, you save a life, but you also could potentially hurt other lives. Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse Prevention says that one of the core principles in the development of a comprehensive substance abuse prevention plan should be a plan that enhances protective factors um, and reverses or reduces risk factors, um, neither of which um, drug testing does. So um, it, I've, it, I have been, you know, my view on this has been clear, I think, from the beginning. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, I. I so, so procedurally, because procedurally, yeah. you asked me that question. I did. The board did direct me to bring a policy yeah, to did. you. So um, if you are, if you want to make a motion and get a second and take a vote on whether the policy continues to a second reading, you can do that procedurally, right? From a mm -hmm. Robert's Rules of Order. Yeah. Um, but I was already directed to bring it. I know. So uh, we've never, that. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to. Russ, do you have thoughts? Because I also was, was intrigued by the possibility of um, allowing all of the other things that we are doing and test, you know, getting our baseline data. And with all of the other things, education and things that we are doing, why not see if that works first before we engage in a um, more invasive um, endeavor. Right. I found that to be an intriguing option as well. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think a better from a Robert Fool rules of order is to take no action until the next meeting, whether the action is to make a motion to adopt it followed by a motion to table it or to you know vote it up i think i don't think this is a first reading that it's really an actionable okay it, it's not really an actionable issue at the first reading okay it would be more sense. like because we're not actually voting on the policy now right, right. we're right. really just trying to right. take it I think, to what we would what, what vote i think on. it makes more sense for the action either Voting the policy up or down, or tabling the policy mm -hmm. for a future date, probably makes more sense for an action item. The, okay. An action item mm -hmm. on the May, you know, or, or a future board right. meeting, whether right. it's May or whether it's that makes sense. June. Right. I think that I think that's probably procedurally mm -hmm. the proper way to, okay. to go. That makes sense. How many years have we done the Pride Survey? Uh, Pride Survey has been every year since I've been here for seven years for sure. Okay, and the data has been fairly consistent that 50% of seniors are using alcohol and 25% are using marijuana. Self-reporting. Self-reporting, yeah. Anecdotal. What percentage of our students currently engage in ex extracurriculars uh, and or parking? Roughly 88%, close to 90%. So we have a lot of usage with a lot of protective factors already. The needle hasn't moved. But we haven't put it with the education. We haven't put it with all of the We've had we we have had education but I take, but I'm gonna take an issue with the Pride survey data because that is um, surveying second semester seniors in the month that they go to prom. So I would imagine that their use in the last 30 days would be a little bit higher than, which is why I sort of have argued that the Pride Survey data might not be the most accurate picture. Which is why um, we've tried to get right. better yeah. data. Right, so we're trying to get better data to really understand what our issue is, so I would say that actually that's not necessarily a accurate portrayal of what um, um, our overall use is in the, in the school. It may be, but those are still high numbers. Again, but I don't think that they're at either they're necessarily accurate. Again, just given the timing of when, I'm a survey researcher, right? And so when you're surveying somebody around a particular significant event you know, that happens that provides them with a lot more opportunity, it's not necessarily a good picture of what they have been doing you know, through their other four years in, in the district. So um, I, I would not base a decision on 
the pride survey data. So that's me as a survey researcher. Understand. Any other board discussion to help me do my job? <laughs> no, I think we've made it hard enough. <laughs> So do you, want, do you want to summarize what you think? Uh, you've heard? Oh, no. It's no, the same yeah. policy. No, I do. Minus. Yes. Um, what I'm bringing back for the second reading is the same policy with the elimination of the preseason assessment, but with the similar uh, parent report only, and then the follow-up random tests, um, and the sunset clause of three years um, to analyze efficacy, if that's desired by the board. And at this time, I'm not adding anything opt-in or opt-out based on the feedback that I thought I heard. But I would like to see an opt-in. Okay. Opt-in? No, opt-out. Oh, opt-out. Okay. Oh, no. Opt-in. Opt-in. Opt yeah. I, I, okay. <laughs> now you're just confusing me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And, and, Rush, you favor an opt-in? I favor the policy we've talked about. Okay. I'm, I'm certainly, look, this is a difficult issue. The research is mixed. I think it will make a difference. I believe it will make a difference. But I also understand that it is a extraordinarily enthusiasm for an opt-in program, I am skeptical that we would get the level of participation that would make a difference, but I'm open to the discussion. Okay. Um, I, you know, we have a proposal here going forward. I don't, if we want to talk about modifying it, I suppose the discussion would happen at the next meeting or, uh, or amending it or tabling it or however we want to do it. But, but I, you know, while I favor gather all the information I can. I receive all the input I can from folks pro and con. Um, I would not rule out a discussion on opt-in if, okay. if the board feels, um, you know, you haven't committed to that. No, I haven't. So I'm not holding you to that. I'm, if the board feels that that's a viable uh, or attractive alternative, um, I'm not going to, I wouldn't say no. I I cannot commit to a opt-in vote, but I will not commit to this draft, and I will, will vote no for this. So while I can't commit to voting, my ears are open more if there is an opt-in possible down the road. But otherwise, it's three of you pulling the decisions for what's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> Okay. You know, there's a long time between now and yes. May 22nd. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, the 22nd. I, I will have opt-in language available for consideration if, if so desired on May 22nd. Okay. Any other comments about the policy or the issue in general? Um, do you feel like you have enough for what you need our next steps to be? I do. Okay. I may rely on my colleagues back there to refresh my memory. But, <laughs> or I can go to the tape. So I think I have. Last thing I would say is, and I know we've all heard from a lot of folks in the community, pro and con. And I know we're all grateful for that. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the um, discussion has been um, very informative. It's been very um, thoughtful. There's not many name calling that I know of. Uh, it's the, the, the research that folks have suggested has been useful. And I can tell you, I, I have, and I, I think all of my colleagues have, we look at everything that we can get our hands on. Um, and so I, I thank you for sitting, sitting through our meeting tonight. The first part of the meeting is what we do. This isn't what we usually do. Uh, but 
we're really grateful to you for caring and for showing up. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. I and, just want to say, again, yeah. we, we said this at the end of the work session last week, and we're all coming at this from a, a, from a place of wanting to help students, right? And, you know, I don't, I just want people to know that as well, right? I mean, we just, and we disagree, obviously, on what the best um, methods for that are, but it really is, we're trying to, you know, help students make good decisions. So um, I do believe that we as a board have, that's the direction that we're coming at this from, so. Um, thank you. Uh, I was going to, it's been a while since I quoted my dad, but he <laughs> said, you know, son, smart people can disagree and both be right. So, you know, it's okay. Um, you're having a thoughtful conversation, and I think you modeled for the students in this room a civil conversation about a difficult topic, and that doesn't happen very often anymore. And so I think they were exposed to what, governance bodies should be doing is having difficult conversations about difficult topics and they may agree to disagree and that's okay um, and then they'll have to make a decision so um, I know that all of you um, care deeply about our students I know that you're not coming at this from a, uh, a punitive perspective and I appreciate your uh, willingness to serve and do the work of the, the Board of Education because we do great work as an administrative and government governance team so I thank you for um, your continued efforts on that so thank you Thanks. so that take oh. yeah yep so that does take us to our action agenda you are more than welcome to stay but it is 10 o'clock I can understand you might want to get up Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I really do. Call me in the morning. Mike, nobody wants to chat? Yeah. I'm open. I'm also glad I sat here to realize that you're in the rain for it all. All right. So the action agenda. Um, Actually, Craig, you might want to listen to this. Um, we, uh, I am recommending um, our planning commission representative, Jeremy Young. So moved. Second. Him. Second. Andrew. And so Jeremy is a, an attorney that lives here locally, has younger children, and he is uh, willing to serve as our ex officio representative for the Granville Schools on the Granville Village Planning Commission. Any questions? Okay. Take roll, please. Mr. Mallory, aye. Mr. Conn. Aye. Mr. Blaze. Yes. Aye. Aye. Mr. Barman. Aye. Thank you very much. I think you will do a fantastic job representing the school district. The next appointment is 9.02, appointment to the Granville Community aye. Foundation. So moved. Second. Um, I will, so Olivia Aguilar is a professor at Denison University and uh, a strong supporter of education and education outcomes and she is willing to serve as our representative on the Community Foundation. And your last representative is now the president of the foundation, so there's a career so path. Yeah, the farm team? Farm yeah. team, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, any questions? I just want to say I'm thrilled to have her on board to bring a diverse, fresh voice to Old Grantville, as it is called by the people on that foundation <laughs> yeah, yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. thank you. With appreciation. Absolutely. Thank you both, please. Ms. Dee. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corner. Aye. Thank you. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted you to have those appointments in case you wanted to reference them. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, 9.03 is the lack of service level agreement for 2017-18. So moved. Second. Uh, this is, LACA is our ITC. They provide our internet services and fiscal software. Uh, so um, they tend to have uh, 
limited increases in uh, expenditures, so I think it's actually holding steady. Yes, I think it is. Yeah. Are they getting more districts to join yeah, their are. consortium to help lower the costs? They have. Yeah, they have in the last couple of years. Yeah. Had, they added about one a year. Yeah. Great. Licking Valley was the last addition. And Medina the year before. Yeah, Medina before that. Great. Any questions? Take a roll, please. Mr. Jeans. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Thorne. Aye. Ms. Deans. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Thank you. 9.04 is an overnight field trip uh, with uh, FCCLA to the National Conference. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, this is um, one student that has qualified for the National Competition and Conference. Plus Barb Bladder again. I know. Right? Yeah. He does yeah. fantastic extracurricular she things. She does. And curricular things for that matter. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you know who the student is? Um, oh my gosh, red hair, Debbie Bigley. Yeah. I'm like, I know that I can and, picture her. <laughs> and what she's going for? I don't know okay. that. Maybe we can find out and put it in the I can. Thank you. I think it's already been reported in the Blue Ace News. I'm sure it has. But I can. Remind me? Yep. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Take the roll, please. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Ms. Roller. Aye. Hi. Thank you. Uh, the next is the um, middle schools at work grant. Um, Mr. Burnett. Oh. oh, so moved. Okay. Second. And uh, Mr. Burnett and Ms. Ormond worked. Uh, Ms. Ormond worked on securing another four thousand dollar grant for project based learning. Great. So, yep. Yeah, he's asleep. No. <laughs> He's reading. Yeah. Um, any questions? Is it, does, is it um, any particular project or just? It, it's in general for our project-based learning initiative. Great. Any other questions or comments? Take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. So move. Yes. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Mr. Hi. That was great, Dallas. Thank you. I had uh, next <laughs> item 9.06 is the approval of the contract for GIS roof. Second. Okay, so um, we've this has been a long conversation as well. Went yeah. from a metal roof, uh, which was continuing to escalate in cost, but was a longer term solution, back to a shingle roof to the tune of five. Hundred thousand seven or five hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars, one hundred thirty-eight. Um, so, it is going to be a shingled roof. We are placing a membrane underneath the roof that would um, help make it last longer, and we're also using a an interlocking shingle that has is rated at one hundred and ten miles per hour. So, one of the issues was the shingles that are currently on um, have been peeling because of the wind tunnel that is. The intermediate school. <laughs> was this, what was our original budget for this, and where did those funds come from, and how does this higher number well, lower the number? The original, well, the original budget was four hundred and fifty thousand right, dollars, right. and that came from a discussion with a roofer, who, when asked why they gave us such a low number, said, "Oh, I didn't know you wanted to use it for planning purposes." Uh, and. Sorry. And so, <laughs> okay. And, and not to be clear, not the roofer we're using. Anymore. Correct. <laughs> not the roofer we're using in the project. Um, so we did have basically yeah. the the lease purchase that yeah for the lighting and right. also included two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars towards the four fifty about half about half the cost. And there was budget for the additional half the cost in the PI budget. In the, in the PI, PI budget, basically the PI budget is now going to absorb another hundred and twenty thousand dollars above right. the original four fifty. But the PI budget could not absorb a one point three million dollar cost for right. a metal roof. Right. And I've been putting actually just working on morning today putting the PI budget together and. This is within what we can do. Okay. And I know it's, there's longevity. What's the longevity of a shingle? Well, up here it's hard to predict, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. It's a. It should be. I think it's a forty-year shingle. Is that accurate? Yes. Forty-year. Okay. The ones um, that are on the roof are probably. And also we have cl we have a claim currently active with the previous shingle provider. Um, it's more of a class action issue, uh, but we're trying to get some reimbursement. But it's really hard to but, yeah. give them the documentation that they're insisting on. But at least we're pursuing we're that. Trying. Whether it results in anything, but hey, we got we got lead water remediation replacement dollar, so you know it's worth trying. We have confidence in the, that the contract caps our expenses here, so that we're not going to have significant uh, increases. Increases in yeah, I I I would say I am much more comfortable with this bid being a solid bid because everything has been laid out as far as what escalators we would like to choose or not. Okay. And we've chosen just the membrane. There was a, and yeah, that's so probably was a core grammar. On the, yeah. the cost, in case you couldn't hear. Yeah. We're, we're budgeting 600000 And when, when is the work to be done? This summer? This summer. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Roll, please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Thank you. Uh, approval of the consent agenda A um, 10.01 A through C 8 and including the addendum items of an additional retirement of Marvin Bright and um, no, the, the other one's not part of it. Oh, that's right. Just just that item. So moved. I'll second. Okay. Um, so I'd like to highlight, obviously, several of the um, acceptance of donations, including the Granville Community Foundation support of the Granville Film Club or the High School Film Club. Uh, C1 is the annual non-renewal of all the supplementals. Remember, we started doing that practice last year, and then in May you will rehire those who are going to continue those positions. The non-renewals are the two people that have been filling long-term sub-positions uh, for the district, uh, and you'll see um, hopefully soon at the next board agenda um, the hiring of a long-term orchestra solution um, and then we have extended time contracts for summer work for the 17-18 school year and Tim Stanton which is for the actual 17-18 school year yes not the, he does not work an extra 350 hours over the summer no. <laughs> that's just the way his contract is structured yes because yeah. of all the evening hours yeah. that he puts in uh, Lisa Rogers resignation is actually a resignation to then be transferred into a fourth grade position uh, Ralph Hicks is uh, resigning to move uh, we have two retirements Denise Mack and uh, Marvin Bright and so Ralph um, Denise and Marvin I want to make sure that I make a special effort to say with appreciation of their service um, Denise's class was the class that came up with Learning for Life. So that's kind of like a nice little nice swan nice song area. piece to her career. Uh, Mr. Hicks has been um, very active in promoting student health at the middle school and, and um, engaging students of every size, shape, and uh, color, you name it, every description, trying to get them physically active. And I, I think he's um, done a good job of that. And then Marvin Bright has been at the high school for many years. Uh, he probably will continue in his coaching role for golf, um, but he is uh, ready to retire and uh, move on to the next phase of life. So we appreciate his service to the community. All those will be posted or have been posted already, and we're seeking qualified candidates. And then the leaves of absence. Any questions or comments about the Agenda? No? All right, take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Mr. Tom. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Thank you very much. Financials 11.01, the 
monthly financial report for the month of March. So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, if no one will object, um, there's nothing I really have to add that, <laughs> that I haven't already talked about the five year forecast, so I will pass on the, unless you want me to really do a presentation on the, on the month, <laughs> there's really nothing that. There's nothing, there's, no, there's nothing that has been that. was not covered in the five year forecast presentation. Thank you. Great. Questions or anything? All right, take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. James. Aye. Dr. Former. Aye. Thank you. Eleven point oh two, the actual remembrance to adopt the five year <laughs> forecast. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Can we hear it again? <laughs> if, if that's really what you I'd want like to move, move to object. <laughs> <laughs> Out of order. I had a question about a number on the <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No. Thank you. It's With thanks. As always. Yeah. 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 And congratulations on your award. I Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad we had somebody come today. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Appreciate right. you all the time. <laughs> but he didn't give you anything. Did he already send it's it? It's already in the office. Yeah, I forgot, <laughs> you forgot it. <laughs> Jamie said, did you bring the certificate or the plaque to actually award? I said, right. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even think he about it. He sent it to the printer to be blown up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should get a Granville Excellence pen or something. <laughs> I'm sure he has one. Sure. Oh, there you go. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and one for Tina. Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. All right, take the roll, please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. That 11.03, which is on the um, addendum for the land lab. So moved. Second. Um, this is. The appropriation effort was for $10,000. I was planning to do this in May or June to align it with the additional money that the Fish and Wildlife Service has given us for phase three um, in light of the, what we did last month or the month before. Um, unfortunately, a bill came today that exceeded the appropriation authority for some of the planting that they're doing. So I say, okay, we better do this so, I can, so we can, we have the money already. We have the authority from the county. We just don't have the appropriation. Okay. So this is just aligns appropriation with the amount of money that's been, will have been donated for the fiscal year. So, and this is all fish and wildlife. Why don't they just kind of pay for it themselves? What is it funneled through us for some it's, reason that way or? I, yeah, it's the way the grants established mm -hmm. is basically <laughs> they send us the money, the vendors send us the bill. We hold the bill till we, if we don't, pay the bill until we get the money from the Fish and Wildlife Service. We got the additional $22,000 last week. Okay. Um, and then we had enough authority for the one bill I knew we had. Okay. I didn't know that this other bill was coming this quickly. Right. Um, it showed up today. And so I, I didn't want to have to wait a month to pay the bill. Yeah. I'm pleased things are moving forward quickly. I drove by and noticed the land with all the discs and things. And after I dropped Katie off this morning here at the intermediate school, I drove by and Brent was out there. Uh, getting ready to plant and things like that, but in also encouraging there were four students right along with him awesome. that were working the land and figuring things out. And I think it was a great example of the educational uh, opportunities there. So it felt good to see things and in progress. There's a uh, groundbreaking ceremony on Thursday evening oh. um, that I was just notified of. Oh. So um, if you could send that along, I to will us, send it to good. you. It came to me today, so I will forward that on to you. Um, I think it's at seven o'clock. I think it's later, but uh -huh. I will I will send you an email. Any other questions? Thank you. Mr. Rose, Mr. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Second. Everybody want to go? <laughs> Take a roll, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. 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 A